Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 30th meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. Our first item of business today is a decision to take item three in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Fantastic. We'll move on to item two, National Care Service Scotland Bill. So our main item of business today is two panels of evidence on the National Care Service Scotland Bill. This is our second evidence session on the bill. I welcome to the meeting our first panel, Frank McKillop, Head of Policy and Research in Able Scotland. Rachel Cackett, Chief Executive Officer, Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland. Beth Reid, Senior Policy Officer, Crisis. Chris Gerka, Community Leader, Director, Larch Highland. And Andrew Ewan, Chief of Staff, Leonard Cheshire, who are joining us in the room today. Hello, everyone. She, um, also, Sheena Arthur, Partnership Manager for Health and Social Care, Glasgow Council for the Voluntary Sector, who is joining us remotely. Hello. Um, just a few points to mention about the format of the meeting before we start. Sheena and members attending remotely, please wait until I or the member asking the question say your name before speaking. Sheena, please allow our broadcasting colleagues just a few seconds to turn on your microphone before you start to speak. And you can also indicate with an R in the dialog box in blue jeans or simply with a show of your hand if you do wish to come in on a question. For all our witnesses, please don't feel that you have to answer every single question if you've nothing new to add <clears throat> to what's been said by others. That's fine. We do have a, a big panel this morning. Um, we've got a, a lot to cover as well, so I would ask everyone to keep questions and answers and f any follow-up questions tight, please. Colleagues in the room should, should indicate to myself or the clerk if they wish to come in and ask a supplementary question. Um, and I would please ask all members to direct your questions to a specific member of the panel. Um, and committee members online should use the chat box or WhatsApp. We're quite tight for time today, but I'll try to give all members an opportunity for questioning. So we will move straight to questions um, from members, and I will bring in Paul McLennan first. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, do, the policy memorandum in, in, the, in the, the bill actually mentions about phasing of transfer functions from 25 to 26 only to be based on delivery readiness assessments. Clear, transparent local transition plans will be developed with partners so that everyone is affected is comfortable with what is happening, where and when. I'm just going to ask the panel about how it is best to ensure that process reform does not destabilise your services. And Andrew will probably come to yourself first of all, and then just go around the panel. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, I, think, I think the key thing here is that because of the sequencing of the bill, because it's an enabling piece of legislation, I think what that runs the risk of is the fact that the co-design process has to be from the get-go. We have to ensure that people with lived experience can feed in, because of course the structures have to be right in order to facilitate co-design in itself. So I think one of the key considerations that the Scottish Government need to make is that they need to build um, the systems in place, but they, they need to build confidence that can allow providers, that can allow people who are supported in social care to have clarity about their entitlements and also about that there's not going to be any gaps in service provision. I think one of the problems with the bill as it stands is that in terms of the broad principles, we need to better understand from the government how these can actually be fulfilled by individuals. Individuals need to have clarity about how they can realise uh, their rights, how they've got right to redress. That links in with the principles of the bill, but also with the charter. So all of these issues are, are intertwined um, and they're, they're inextricably linked. Um, so I think, I think that's the key thing. We need a bit more clarity from the government. I think we owe it to the people who are in receipt of care and support to provide them with confidence that the system is not going to let them down. As a, as a sector, as a as a field, we are struggling with significant challenges here and now. The process of, of passing this bill cannot exacerbate those challenges, and I think that's a real concern at this stage. Okay, Andrew, thanks for that. Um, I'll probably come to yourself, uh, Rachel, uh, if that's OK, just on, for your point of view, and I'll maybe open up and see if anybody else wants to come in. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to come and speak to you all today. Um, so CCPS is a member organisation of 91 exclusively third sector providers, some around this table today, and we work alongside around a quarter of a million people. Our members do. They employ around 40,000 staff, 5,000 volunteers work with them, and they manage around one and a half billion in income. Now, I start my answer to your question in that way because I think it's really important to understand the size of the third sector and the need for stability in that in order to get to the point of an NCS. 
And also on the co-design point that was just being raised there, the importance of the voice of our, our members in that co-design frontline focused process. Now, we, our members are very interested in this bill, inevitably, and we met a number of them yesterday to talk about the next steps in the legislation. And what I heard really clearly is that reform is needed. You're not going to hear from our providers um, the, the need to sort a system that is, in many places, broken and unfair. So we know there is a huge amount of unmet need. We've still got competitive contracts that don't focus on outcomes for people and on relationship at the front line. There's a total lack of fair work where we are at the moment. Self-directed support is not yet implemented properly and we have a lack of parity for the third sector in a sense that sometimes social care exists to relieve the pressure of our acute sector, which is important but not really the point of social care. So I would say in answer to your question that that vision of where we go is really important. And um, as a membership organisation, we took time when the bill was published to really try to articulate the vision of where we thought this bill should get us to. And I've shared with the committee um, our vision for reform. And we're now using that to overlay on the bill to work out, is this bill the right reform to get us there? And if it's got holes or gaps at the moment, can it be amended to get us there? So I think vision is really important. We need to know what we're aiming at if we're asking people to go on a really radically different journey. And we have to articulate that really clearly. We hope what we have done is a helpful contribution. Um, we would like to see that vision far more at the front of the discussions on this piece of legislation, which is a framework bill focused largely on structure. The other point that was raised was the current situation we're in. And it is dire. It is really very hard. Providers have their backs against walls financially at the moment. We have a recruitment and retention crisis within the sector. We cannot get enough staff to deliver. And that puts us all in a very difficult position whilst we're also trying to deal with this vision of a big structural reform. The Auditor General was on BBC Scotland this morning talking about the importance of reform if we're going to deal with where we're at, and I think he's right. What we need to make sure is we've definitely got the right reform, and that's why we, like all of the committees in Parliament who are looking at this legislation, are taking our time through this stage one process to work with our members and partners to check, can this bill get us to where we think social care should be, which is about enabling people to live the lives they want to lead. That should be what we're focused on. In order to do that, given the size of the third sector that I've uh, set out, we do need to make sure we have a third sector to deliver on a national care service. Mm -hmm. And that does mean we need a twin track. And one of those is about making sure we have stability right now. CCPS has worked with our members and put out a winter manifesto called Urgent Action for Urgent Times, which is on our website. Again, in keeping with our model of change, we are trying to be as solutions focused here as we possibly can and to make sure that we're offering options to try and ensure that stability is there now to allow us to vision and make change into the future. Okay. Mitchell, thanks for that. Just, just, I'll probably open it up. But there was, you mentioned about, about the issue around about contracts, which I think I was going to ask about the second part of the question. Was really said the bill allows contracts to be reserved to voluntary and third sector organisations. I don't know what your views are on that, if you see disadvantages or advantages in that. And I'll maybe open it up and ask other, other groups to come in on the contact issue as well as the, the broader question I asked. But on the specific mm -hmm. issue that you mentioned about contracts. So I think there are two things in the legislation. One is its provisions around ethical commissioning and one is it's around its reserved contracts. And the two things, I think, are, are interlinked. In terms of the ethical commissioning point, it's very thin at the moment, and certainly if the bill continues, we would like to see that strengthened considerably, because the whole ethical commissioning is something that should be at the heart of a reformed, radically reformed service. Competitive tendering is not a good way forward. Um, that then obviously links into the provisions on reserved contracts. At the moment, I think there are two issues for us in, in the provisions in the bill. One is, do they go far enough? Are they just a rewriting of EU, EU regulation into Scots law? Um, are they as radical as they could be? Certainly, the idea of reserving contracts in certain circumstances could be a really positive way of thinking about how do we um, change the way in which we procure services right now. So that's, that's certainly one issue. The other is there's no commitment in the bill to ever use those provisions. So we can put things into law, but that doesn't mean they're actually going to make a change. And I think that's the commitment that we really need to see if that is going to be the way, one of the ways to change how we procure social care in Scotland. We need a commitment that it will be used. Okay, Rachel, thank you. Frank, you probably bring yourself in. 
about mention about obviously reform doesn't destabilise your services, but also on the contract issue, and if you can pick up on these as well. Yeah, I think on the, the first point, um, there is no doubt that reform is required, uh, and that is why we have welcomed the introduction of the National Care Service Bill. Um, you know, absolutely echo the points that Rachel and Andrew have made, um, uh, especially with the crisis that is facing the social care sector at the moment. Um, we need immediate action, as well as the broader, longer-term structural reforms. Um, and I think, to be honest, there is perhaps some uh, immediate term structural reform that is required. I think we are already seeing the challenges. You know, if, if things worked as they are, we would not be in this situation that we are with social care. So I think that, that is, as far as we are concerned, sufficient evidence for the need for reform. And I think even in the immediate term, as we try to tackle the, the challenges that are facing the social care sector at the moment, um, I think we are seeing that, that frustration at times, that there is perhaps a, a reluctance to embrace some of the more innov innovative ideas uh, and the measures that might be taken to try and relieve some of the pressures that there are on the social care sector. And, you know, I think the, the most obvious one there when we're thinking about fair work and um, we're thinking about terms and conditions and enhanced pay for frontline social care staff. Um, uh, you know, the, the, we have to take that seriously. Um, obviously, there has been um, the, the cuts that have un unfortunately been required to the health and social care budget in order to fund an NHS pay rise, um, but we do not see where the, the funding is for a social care pay rise in the current financial year. Uh, and I think it is those sort of challenges, and we, we prioritise what is important to us. Where is the prioritisation of the social care workforce? Um, because if, if we do not prioritise the social care workforce, then we are building up these problems um, for ourselves as a society and indeed for the NHS. You know, extra funding for an NHS pay rise is not much use if the NHS is on its knees because social care has not been built up to the capacity that is required. Um, so I think that is certainly a concern that we have. Uh, and there is a need, of course, there is a need for the long term reform, um, but we need to have immediate reforms as well, um, perhaps outside of this legislation, um, just at a local level uh, and across Scotland to ensure that we are doing more there. I think on the point about contracts, um, again, that is something that we welcome. I know it is a bigger philosophical and political um, discussion about the, uh, the, the delivery of care and the models for delivery of care. Um, the evidence is there. We, we saw the worst evidence, of course, during the COVID pandemic about the performances of the different sectors um, and the different methods of care delivery. Um, you know, even, even keeping away from uh, the, the sort of horrific statistics that, that came through from that period, uh, especially in care home settings, we know from the care inspectorate that the third sector achieves better grades than the private sector. Um, and we know that, especially for care at home services, um, they are more popular, they are more widely chosen by people to provide their care in their community. Um, around 46 per cent um, of the social care workforce uh, for care at home services is in the voluntary sector, um, with about 27 per cent each in the private and public sector. So we know the voluntary sector has a very strong record, particularly in delivering care to people in their own homes and in their communities. Um, so I think something in the, the bill that recognises that uh, I think is welcome. As Rachel said, that power has to actually be used. Um, but I think it is that evidence-based policy making. You know, we know people are choosing the third sector for their care. They are choosing the third sector because the care inspector tells us the third sector does a lot of these things better than other sectors. And I think that that evidence base uh, and learning from what works and what people are already choosing um, needs to be a driving light for, for the development of the policy. Okay, if I may, just one, one final one. Chris, probably from yourself, because I mean, obviously the policy has to work right across Scotland. In terms of that, the same question about, about the reform not destabilising your services and again, the contract point of view, and I'm conscious of the time convener, so um, <coughs> over, over to yourself. Thank you, Paul. I just want to, I, I mean, this message has been made clear already, but the, sis, the, you know, the sector is not stable at the moment, and we're about, about to embark upon change and reform, which is required. But only two years ago, I had a colleague who, um, you know, a Ugandan lady came to the UK to train as a mental health work, uh, nurse to work over here. She died. She left two children without a parent, uh, you know, in the height of the COVID epidemic. And she was getting, you know, it was called the living wage, but it's minimal. You know, we've, we've got tremendous pressures on the system with recruitment and retention. We... We get criticised. Management and leadership in the sector gets criticised, but we've not been given uplifts to allow us to maintain pay differentials with, with uh, particularly uh, frontline managers within the sector. And we need to be very, very careful about how we we go away, uh, go around the implementation of this bill. I think. 
to be frank with you, it might, I know there's a debate about whether the co-design should have happened first, but my sense is from a third sector perspective and experience in working in co-design and production with, with, with people who receive services, is that you, if you look at the outcomes within the bill, they're very fine principles. I'm not too sure if you work through that, you'd end up coming, coming to the conclusion that we possibly need a national care service to address these. Now, we may very well need a, an improved capacity to, to draw the sector together, but I fear that we may be you know, spending hundreds of millions of pounds on the creation of something that isn't actually delivering the outcomes and benefits to the end users, and surely that's what we're all about. In terms of the, in terms of the third sector involvement, I think, yeah, as Frank has said, the, the third sector delivers, delivers value, quality to end users. Once again, you know, if the plan is to, to transfer set services into the third sector and those services come with significant costs in Chupi, then we've got to, you've got to consider, is the sector funded enough? Do we get full cost recovery in order to enable us to do that? And, you know, are, are we, you know, in terms of small organisations as well, are we given the support as well to, to to, to maintain our position within the, the ecology of third sector organisations. So, to my mind, the, you know, the creation of the National Care Service is welcome, but it doesn't need to be this big bureaucratic bay moth that it might be. It doesn't need to be a precondition for delivering ANS law, fair work within the sector, and all of the other the complaint service, all of the other laudable aims within, within the, the bill. So, I, I yeah, I would urge caution because we we can't take any more. And you know the situation is very sick in NHS Highland. You know I've got a situation where if you're a social care worker and you're starting pay, you start on a band four, so your starting pay is four thousand pounds more than we can offer than we're funded for. And you know it's a lead, lead provider, uh, lead agency model as you know up there. So it's just the same commissioner and provider is is paying. You know that's sick, and and it, it needs to stop. You know it's a question of justice. I'm going to um, uh, we're out of time. Unless yeah. anybody else wants to come in, I'm quite happy with the questions I've got. So. OK, thanks, Paul. I'll bring you back in later. Thank you. Um, we'll move now to questions from Deputy Convener Emma Roddick to be followed by Pam duncan Glassy. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, Chris Larch has recommended that personal assistance be regulated. Uh, would you be able to expand on why that's needed and what impact it could have? Yes, thank you. Um, the, the notion for that came from a very practical experience of working with families who have generally family members of, of children who have a learning disability and they get to a stage in their life where they can no longer, uh, they no longer feel comfortable in being an employer and attending to all the administration that's required with regard to an SDS1 option. What I find with those, those people that do chupy into the third sector from, from that is that they those, those colleagues really welcome the training opportunities which, which can be given and also the, the, the experience within the experience of employment within, within the, the third sector from a larger organisation. And it seems to me that it's important that the National Care Service considers SDS and how we can support those people that rightly want to, um, want to take up SDS option one in order to be uh, you know, a good employer and offer fair work to their employees and offer the, the training that the, those employees require. I note that in the SDS uh, survey in, in, of this year that 45% of personal assistants said they had to fund their own training. 25% of new personal assistants, uh, only 25% of new personal assistants said they'd re received training in the last year. And only 40% percent feel that they've got any job security within, within the S S SDS1 options, 11 percent are on zero hours contracts and 12 percent don't have a contract. Now obviously there, there are grave concerns about social justice, about fair work within that sector and in no way should, <laughs> am I suggesting that the choice of control which is at the very heart of, of self-directed support should be, should be challenged or in, in any way. But I think there is a great opportunity here, perhaps through 
um, personal assistance being added to the SSSC register and for some element of support for, for SDS1 employers to give a better experience to personal assistance. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, and I'm interested that you mentioned SSSC. There has been some concern that, that having PAs register that way would, would push them towards a more clinical uh, qualification and, and career uh, trajectory. Is there, do you share any of those concerns or is there anything that, you know, conversely, you wouldn't want to see in, in regulation of PAs? Well, it strikes me that the, the workforce is, is one. Uh, it may, I don't know if it seems different, maybe from a different perspective, but at the, at the front line, you know, you've got people moving from personal assistant roles into the third sector, into the private sector, the independent sector, and moving around. So it strikes me that it would be helpful for the, sis, for the sector if, there was, if it was easy to transfer from role to role, if the, everyone in the sector um, worked to the same code of practice, if everyone had the same opportunities for training and qualifications, if personal assistance as well could... I mean, the SSSC isn't supposed to be a stick to beat people with. It's not supposed to lead to a clinical and health orientated um, um, culture within the workforce. I don't think it does. So for me, it would be an opportunity really to create parity and to create a more professional and flexible workforce. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just my, my last question around this theme. Um, coming from the Highlands, uh, is there anything in particular that you think the National Care Service needs to consider uh, when working with third sector providers in different geographical areas? Yeah. Um, yeah it, it, it seems to most, most of my, my peers who work within the Highlands that rurality, <laughs> the reality of living in the Highlands and I'm sure other rural parts of Scotland as well, the borders, etc., is not understood often um, by people in the central belt, uh, frankly. And I'm concerned that assumptions will be made that the way in which services can be run and configured, the way in which co-design can happen, the, the, you know, the, the, frankly, the, the funding required for operations in, in a very rural area with actually working within fragile communities as well um, can be the same. So my, my fear is that this, some of this sense that this, the National Care Service, if the secondary legislation is wrong, becomes a top-down bureaucratic entity, then it's going to be, you know, we, we, we may end up with services which are, are delivered less well, are funded less well, and in, in the trans transformation as well from the, the local um, IJBs to uh, the care boards as well, that local knowledge is lost. So I, I feel secure at the moment that those who commission our services know very well the reality of, of life in the Highlands. In fact, you know, due to the, the small scale of our communities, they know many of the individuals we support. And we can't, we can't lose that. We can't throw that baby out with the bathwater, as it were. Convener, is it all right? Can I just press a little more on, on that issue? Um, I completely uh, appreciate every, everything you're saying there, Chris. Um, is there anything kind of off the top of your head uh, that you think needs to be included in the co-design process to account for that, that, that would make you feel more secure and, and reassured that, that you're going to be listened to? I think, bro broadly, if the co-design process were to happen locally at grassroots, as it should, if there was funding for service use of representatives and um, you know, simply expenses for travel and, and the, the resources to enable everybody to, to have equal access to the co-design process, there, it didn't just happen in urban centres. I mean, you know, Inverness, Inverness may seem far enough north for you, but what about the people of Wick and Thurso and the islands and all the rest of it? Um, so I, I think there needs to be consideration to it happening. I mean, subsidiarity. That's, you know, the, the decisions happen at the lowest possible level within, within our communities, the closest to the, to the end user. And also, I'm afraid co-design and consultation is expensive if it's done well. It takes time, particularly we work with people with learning disabilities and autism. It takes a great deal of time and resources to do that well, unless it's going to be tokenistic in a tick box, which actually gets us nowhere. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. I'll now take questions from Pam Duncan-Glancy to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. 
Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for the submissions you've um, given to the, the consultation in advance and also for answering uh, the questions you have so far. Um, I'm keen to understand a little bit about the, uh, and we have touched on this this morning, a bit about the experience of some of your members just now and the sorts of things that really need to be addressed um, today and what what is the sort of thing that you could be looking to um, to the future in, in, in a bill like the National Care Service Bill. Um, so I wonder, um, Rachel, if you could maybe uh, talk a bit about the experience of your members just now um, and what we would do today as opposed to longer term. Absolutely, and, and thanks for the question because I think it's such a pressing concern. I mentioned earlier that we've, we've just recently published a piece called Urgent Action for Urgent Times, which I think sums up what we think is needed, and we hope that is a very practical document. Um, when I asked members in our regular member meeting on Monday what their most pressing concern was, because we were meeting with um, the Cabinet Secretary this week, yet again the answer is recruitment retention, recruitment retention, recruitment retention. Social care is, and support is about people, and actually you need the people to have the relationship, to be able to give the consistency that is required in that relationship at the front line, and our members are really struggling. And one of the key reasons that they're struggling is that the bill um, uh, in the principles talks about being an exemplar of fair work. Now, we think that's not strong enough because we don't actually know what being an exemplar is in terms of a principle. But we have been talking about fair work and social care for some years. And what is happening this year is, rather than moving towards fair work, we're moving ever further away. So I've been in post at CCPS just four and a half months, and I would say even in those four and a half months, the tone of um, the debate around this within the sector has markedly changed. And it's changed for a number of reasons. One is that our public sector colleagues have been offered uh, substantial pay awards, and I do not begrudge them that at all. Um, anyone working in health and social care should be paid appropriately. That has not been met with the similar level of uplift for social care staff. More than that, we're hardly mentioned um, in terms of those uplifts. On top of that, uh, the real living wage announcement, with uh, an urgency to bring that in before May, has also not yet translated into the pay packets of people who are working in social care. So whilst a mid-year uplift was given to a, you know, a minimum of £10.50 an hour, that's now 40 pence short of the real living wage. And that's around £800 a year difference. And previously, there was a differential between the real living wage and the starting salary in social care. To do that would be 11.55. We've heard nothing, not a squeak, about how that will be delivered. And what we're hearing, of course, is uplifts have been offered, though not accepted so far. But there is no more money. That gives our providers a real problem, because the money to pay for commission services comes through contracts, which requires that money to be released at a central level. Um, we are hearing of providers who are doing everything they can to recognise the fact that their staff are not getting the real living wage, let alone anything near the uplifts, and those £4,000 differentials are not uncommon in starting salaries between public and third sector providers. Some of them are having to eat into reserves to do that. There are very difficult negotiations happening. That's a very, very pressured space when actually the levers to pay that amount is not with our provider members. It sits with government and, 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 and with local government in terms of how to deliver on that. There are some other practical situations. So during COVID, for example, there were all sorts of uh, immediate actions taken to, 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 to recognise that providers had to focus on the front line. Um, we think some of those could, could happen again. So suspension of tendering, for example, for a period of time over the winter. We know our colleagues, we talked about SSC, um, colleagues in the public sector have been offered SSC fees being paid. For some of our members, uh, employees, finding money for that SSC fee is, is the straw that will break the camel's back. We've not been offered the equity. So I think fair work is absolutely at the heart of what the National Care Service should be. It shouldn't matter who is providing a service, equal pay for equal work and contracts that properly recognise the needs of third sector providers are required. But we could do some of that now. And I appreciate the cost. The cost of not doing it is profound. And I think that is not said enough. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Do you think the, the issues kind of almost might be self-evident, do you think the issues with retention and recruitment are largely around things like paying conditions or are there other factors? I think it's a huge part of what we're hearing. There is a supply issue, which we, we know about, but 
Um, the fact is, when the real living wage was announced at 10.90, many other employers, supermarkets, for example, immediately did the uplift. We have to be aware that the people who work with our, for our providers have to feed their families, they have to pay their bills, they have to do all of those things. And, and the boards and chief execs of our organisations are doing everything they can to keep them. But actually, when it comes down to the, 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 the brass tacks of it right now, when people are really struggling, then actually pay is going to be right at the front of people's minds. And that makes it hard to keep the good people that we have. You know, and we cannot lose that experience. Our other issue is the way in which some of those uplifts have been applied. So it's not always known that the uplifts have only been applied to adult social care. They've not been applied across the entire sector. And they're only applied um, to a percentage of the workforce, which means that within providers, keeping that differential, which some, one of my colleagues mentioned earlier, is really hard. That means what we're seeing as a knock-on consequence is difficulty in keeping some of the more senior posts, particularly if the differential in pay is minor, because why would you want to take on all that additional responsibility mm -hmm. but actually not be rewarded and appropriately re rewarded for doing that? So it's not just that we're seeing difficulties in the very frontline staff. It's as you go up the chain within providers that we're not able to do that. So one of our suggestions is that uplifts, and we certainly hope there will be an uplift, are actually on full contract value, not on a percentage of contract, on an average workforce, which we think is not representative of the sector. Thank you very much for that. Um, can I ask Sheena um, the, the, the same question um, and, and how the, the situation is in, in Glasgow for, for your members? Thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, I would echo um, what has, has already been said. We're, we're seeing um, a sector in crisis and um, the value that the immediate action would be to value the workforce and including our volunteers, we see a sector that is um, been through extremely challenging circumstances and continues to do so. And, and for me, as well as what's been said, we've, we have an issue around the well-being of the workforce. Um, we see higher absence rates, um, recruitment and retention being an issue and um, and the emotional strain on people. You know, we've got um, organisations wondering whether they can heat their service, whether they can um, pay the core cost to keep their service going, whilst trying not to um, destabilise the confidence and the well-being of their, of their people that they, they support. And as has just been said, um, organisations using their reserves to try and um, continue the, to keep their, their service going with the uncertainty of funding decisions, you know, that are coming maybe in a month's time. It's, it's really, you know, the question about not destabilising the sector. We, we don't have a stable sector right now. It's really critical that we do something now and the best thing we can do is that that fair work that valuing what people are doing um, and people are, are working you know to capacity to the top of their ability in extremely challenging circumstances so that support for them is, is really critical um, and I have a real concern about the well-being of of our workforce because people are really committed um, and as has been said, um, excellent standard and a person-centred approach is, is core within our sector. Um, but we've got people at, at all levels really struggling with the pressure thank of the demands. Thank, thank you for that, Sheena. And it's, it's, yeah, it's it really echoed what, um, some of what Rachel said and just paints a, a pretty grim picture, actually, um, of what's going on. So, um, the, the other question I was going to ask, if it's OK, um, is to, to Frank and Andrew um, to ask about the experience of your members just now as, as from a service user point of view um, as opposed to a provider point of view. Um, can you say a, a bit about that and what their experience is and what we need to do today as opposed to longer term? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Yes. Uh, and I think that what we've got to remember with all that when we talk about uh, a crisis of capacity and um, recruitment and retention pressures, what we're actually talking about is individual people are not 
exercising or are able to exercise their right to high quality social care and support. Yep. Um, so whenever we talk about these sort of statistics, it's not in the abstract. It means that as a person, in fact, there's thousands of people who are not receiving the care and support that they need. Um, and, and we know uh, as well, you know, that's 2000 is when the Scottish Government uh, announced the policy intention to, to end institutional care for people with learning disabilities. Lennox Castle was shut in 2002, but in 2018, um, the, the Coming Home report that was uh, produced for the Scottish Government found there were over 700 people with learning disabilities and autism from Scotland who were still in some form of institutional care. For 79 of those people, they weren't even in Scotland, they'd been moved out of the country. Um, so I think that there, are, there are those sort of issues. Um, enables my own front door campaign earlier this year, identified we think there could be over 1,000 people with learning disabilities today who are in hospital or institutional settings who should be in their own community. Um, so I think we, we should never forget that impact. Um, you know, the front page of the National Care Service Bill talks about human rights, and we absolutely applaud that. Um, but again, it's, it's easy to talk about human rights. It's putting that into action is what really matters. And you know, as I said earlier, you know, if, if it's important to us, if it's a priority, then we find a way to do it. Um, and I think that has to be the imperative that drives this. You know, that this isn't an abstract discussion about structures and systems uh, and everything like that. We have to remember this is all for a purpose, and the purpose is delivering and realising the human right that everyone in Scotland has to high quality social care and support in their own community. Thank you. Do you think the bill needs to be strengthened in that sense? I think it's certainly the thing we feel is sort of strangely absent, and it may be an oversight, um, and you know, I think it had been referenced earlier uh, in the evidence. There isn't a specific reference to self-directedness which we find a bit odd. And again, it's probably an oversight. I think we, we do sometimes find in discussion that self-directedness and, and uh, person-centred are interchanged as terms, but they don't mean the same thing. You know, person-centred is still uh, outlining a system where other people are designing mm -hmm. it for that person. So it's better that it's person-centred than supplier-centred or finance-centred. Of course, that's preferable, but it's not the same thing as self-directedness. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're going to have a truly human rights driven and self-directed social care and support system in Scotland, then self-directedness has to be at the heart of that. The legislation is almost a decade old. You know, it's not a new concept in Scotland. It's a concept that many countries around the world have applauded us for. Um, but the reality is it's not happening in practice enough. Um, and we need self-directedness to be right at the heart of, of a national care service and, and indeed for the delivery of care services today. And, and that's for something that we really feel has to be there. Um, I think as Chris had outlined the, the experience with PAs, um, uh, and certainly we recognise that to enable because everything that we are doing, you know, we're delivering two and a half million hours um, of social care and support for over a thousand people every year. Um, and that is all delivered through a PA, a personal assistant model, um, but it is delivered with those individuals are employed by Enable, because we recognise that there's the challenge of self-directed support is that many people, as has been outlined, there's difficulties and challenges. Essentially, you've got to start running a small business, which a lot of people don't like the idea of for obvious reasons. They don't want to have all the pressures and, and requirements of being an employer and everything that comes with that. Um, so we have built a model where Enable, as an organisation, takes on essentially the functions of the employer. Um, we will support the individual with recruitment um, of their own team, but ultimately they make the decision. So we are doing all the stuff in the background for them, but they make the decision about who they employ, and then when that team is brought on board, the individual is self-directing how their budget is spent and what they are doing um, to, to support them to live the life that they want to live. So I think there are those models there out there that are already working. Um, and, and that's demonstrated, you know, we've, we've got 88% of our care inspectorate wellbeing grades um, are at five or six um, for, for very good or excellent. So um, we know it works. And, uh, and I think that just has to be at the heart of it. Self-directedness is absolutely critical when we talk about human rights. Um, and we need to make sure the bill reflects that. Thank you. Do you, sorry, do you have anything further? Sorry, Pam, I was just going to ask if you could wrap up the question, because um, all our members have a very specific amount of time this morning. So I, I don't have another question. I was just hoping that Andrew might come in on the okay, previous question. Just waiting for that. That was all. Thanks very much. I think, I think the conversation about workforce, I think what is often um, the problem in, in the whole debate about the bill so far is that we have to remind ourselves that to deliver person-centred care, we need a workforce that is sustainable, that is funded for the long term, and of course the funding is critical to, to workforce planning. Mm -hmm. I think for any frontline worker to build a strong rapport with the people who they're supporting, we need to understand that actually these relationships really matter, and they affect the quality of care. Mm -hmm. they're, they're integral to it. 
So actually, all of these issues around funding for the long term. I think to echo some of uh, Frank's points as well, the whole debate so far about the National Care Service, I think one of the things that it's lacking is we need to go back to the, the key point here. Who's it for? Whose lives is it intended to improve? I think it's also about ensuring that everybody has a stake in the core design of the National Care Service. I think one of the things, for example, that could be improved is enabling uh, people with lived experience to shape, for example, the strategic plans of the care boards. So at the very grassroots local level, people need to have an input and they need to have clarity about how they can shape the National Care Service. I think we need to focus less on structure and perhaps more on people. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much, Pam. Um, I'll move now to questions from Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Foisal Chowdhury. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I, I've got two questions on this area. Um, and it's really picking up a comment made by Chris that if it's going to be co-designed and properly, it takes time and energy and input. And I suppose I'm just wondering, you know, we've come out of a pandemic, we're, we're facing a very difficult time for many reasons at the moment. Do you think you have the energy and the time, and your members that you represent have the energy and the time to engage constructively with that co-design? Or are you just running to stand still at the moment and this is going to be the straw that breaks the camera's back? Rachel, I don't know if you want to come in first on that. Thank you. Um, there is definitely an issue of bandwidth at the moment. I mean, we've set out some of the issues faced by providers to, to work with people who, who need care and support just now. At the same time, there is also a real understanding of the need to invest in reform. So I know from our point of view that our members are doing everything they can to engage in this debate, but it's tough at the moment because there are so many other pressures on our providers to, to keep the wheels going you know they, 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 they need to keep the doors open over the winter and that's what they're doing and that has to be and should be their priority I think the the focus on co-design is a really positive one if it's genuinely what is meant one of the things that I would say in in the work that we're doing to look at the provisions of the bill and and if the bill could be strengthened to get towards the the vision for social care that we have is around issues of co-design and we think the government could be way more radical in what's in the bill. So the point around uh, local care board plans, for example, um, it's the way the bill is structured is a very traditional consultation approach where somebody writes something and then they throw it out and then a few people give comment. Um, we've done that before. It's pretty much what it says in the Public Bodies Act. I think if the focus is on co-design through the entire process, that matters. Similarly, um, co-design has to work right through the system. So the, one of the big disappointments for us was that Derek Feely's approach to the national governance of this is lost in the bill. So we wanted to see a national care board. Good decisions are made by diversity of voice. Um, I remember once working with a very prominent lawyer when, in an old job looking at failures in, in the health service, and one of the conclusions they made was, if your board is diverse, then actually you'll make a good decision. If it's not, you'll get groupthink. And actually, the, the, the point of the National Care Board was a really important place for co-design because it's where you model as well what it is that you want to see through the entire system. So the fact that's lost in the bill is huge and certainly something that we would want to see put back in. The, the time issue is, is, is definitely one that needs to be grappled with. Um, I would say that the, there are a lot of different areas uh, linked to this bill which are requiring attention at the same time. That is hard. Um, I was aware of the Cabinet Secretary talking about some issues of phasing at the weekend. I'm keen to see what that looks like. I'm aware when the 70 million was taken out of the National Care Service for this year, there was a similar comment. What we're not clear on is what does that look like? And therefore, how do we ensure that we're helping to support our providers to put what energy and space and bandwidth they have into the right things right now? Beth and then maybe Andrew. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment on this. Um, we welcome very much the focus on lived experience. We've been talking about involvement of service users. We need to think about those people who aren't able to access services um, and people who are sometimes labelled as complex, who maybe require services from several different uh, services, health and social care and homelessness and criminal justice and so on often fall through the gaps, cannot access those services, are deemed too difficult. And if their voices are not heard in this, this will not work for them. And, yeah. 
So, uh, where to begin? I think one of, the, one of the things at the heart of all of this is to Rachel's point about the finances behind uh, the system as it stands. I think you're right to say that we are kind of running to stand still. I think actually, alongside the bill, there can be immediate action to take to bring about fair work. And I think remuneration is obviously a part of that. Differentials have been mentioned before. I think the key thing is for us, the Scottish Government in its own language has said about the need for us to, to rethink about, as a society, how we view social care and working in social care. Move away from you know, the, the movement that we saw during the pandemic where sectors like retail and hospitality were impacted, for example, with lockdown restrictions. And a great many people viewed social care as perhaps a changing career, perhaps a stopgap job. If, as a society, we re really value care, in the words of Derek Feely, we need to kind of change the paradigm of what social care is for. And so some of the work around investment, and, and to Rachel's point again, what we cannot do, and I think the financial memorandum of the bill is quite lacking in detail in this regard, is we can't run the risk of investment being withdrawn from frontline delivery because there's a need for IT infrastructure for the systems that are required to put in place. And again, the Scottish Government have, have said that this is going to be a landmark reform, perhaps the most comprehensive public service reform in the history of this Parliament. So we do need the financial wherewithal to ensure that, that this is meaningful and that, that has to start at the front line. And I think that, that needs to be at the heart of the bill. Uh, thank you. I, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to see if I can get a yes, no, or don't know answer from a panel on this. Um, and that is around the, the Charter. Um, the Charter, I don't think, at the moment, gives any new rights. It clarifies the rights that people have. But it doesn't have any legal status. So it's got no legal authority. It can't be challenged by an individual or by an organisation. Um, my yes, no question, or don't know, is um, do you think the Charter should have a legal standing so that, if it's appropriate, judicial review can be taken place. And maybe just go round, start with Andrew and go round, if that's yeah. OK. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I have no comment on that. Um, yes, it needs teeth. Yes, and I think some sort of commissioner or, or body like that that would have a responsibility to support with that. Yeah. Does she not have an answer? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'll uh, leave it there for a moment, Camille. Fantastic. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll move now to Foisal Chowdhury, who is joining us online, to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, I'll be very short. Uh, I think I'll uh, ask Rachel uh, a question. Uh, what kind of cost um, uh, might be created for third sector organisations uh, by the provision on monitoring and information sharing? The question, I mean, it, it largely depends, I guess. I mean, to put a figure on it would be hard because so much of the bill is not clear. So um, in terms of uh, monitoring, one of the things that I would say is the way in which contracts are designed needs to properly reflect the, the liabilities and responsibilities of providers beyond their frontline work. And if there are going to be additional requirements, that has to be reflected in the ability of providers to employ the right people and to do the right work to be able to, um, to, to report on potentially new provisions. So um, in terms of information sharing, uh, one of my colleagues has spoken a bit about IT. Um, there's a lot in the bill which you know, doesn't necessarily give those costs, but we have to remember that if we're going to develop our IT infrastructure, which we would certainly welcome, and we at CCPS run a, a digital project with our, with our providers to look at how to do that well, we also have to be aware of the costs of things like increasing digital literacy um, uh, and the ongoing costs that providers will have in, in having new digital technology. So I can't give you a figure, um, partly because it's not altogether clear from the bill and the financial memorandum what that would look like. Um, we certainly commissioned Fraser of Allender to do quite an extensive piece of work on the financial memorandum, uh, and they obviously came back with the report that has been, I think, widely circulated. 
Um, and I think one of the issues in the financial memorandum is, well, not only obviously is inflation now running at over 11 per cent, so, so some, of the, some of the assumptions that have been made in there aren't, aren't necessarily right, but I guess it goes back to Andrew's point, which is the financial memorandum is set up around the structure change within the legislation, which is what a financial memorandum is meant to do, of course. It's meant to tell you what the bill will cost. But actually, what it doesn't necessarily do is take in all of the other costs, including the cost of actually delivering care to, to pick up Beth's point, um, to, to, to people who we're not even delivering care to at the moment. So I think there's a lot in there that we need to think about in terms of the financial memorandum. But I think your point about the costs for reporting and for um, developing uh, our IT infrastructure have to be accounted for in the type of contracting that goes on to either individual providers or alliances of providers perhaps in the future so that we can do as a sector everything we would want to do in that as well. Thank you very much. I don't have any other question, Convener, on... Thank you. I'll move now to questions from Miles Briggs before we move on to our next theme. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions with regards to um, employment. And in terms of the bill as it stands, what's your understanding of who the employer would actually be for many of your members? Rachel, I maybe mm -hmm. start with you. So my assumption for our members is that they will continue to employ the staff that they employ um, and that will depend on how services are commissioned and what they're funded to deliver. I do think there are some other parts of the bill where we're perhaps less clear. So um, obviously the, 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 the paperwork accompanying the bill suggests a pretty whole scale transfer of social care and social work staff to the National Care Service and one of the questions that we've been really grappling with over the last few weeks is, is the National Care Service a service delivery organisation or is it a commissioning organisation? And I know some of the comment back is that whether or not those staff will transfer to the National Care Service is up for co-design but it seems a fundamental difference in the purpose of the National Care Service as an entity on whether it is intending to deliver services itself. Some of the other questions that we've been trying to work through, and I haven't seen anything yet on this uh, more publicly, is the issue of 2P transfer, which certainly one of, our, one of our colleagues was mentioning. So we've been trying to sort of work through, you know, if, if staff are not transferred, but actually contracts go from current local authority provision to a third sector, what are the implications and the cost implications for our members on that? And how do you deal with all the usual things like pensions? So we think in terms of almost working through the potential consequences of what the bill is suggesting on employment, workforce and associated costs and responsibilities needs more work. Um, we would certainly wish to see that quite quickly because not only is it about cost, but it's about the fundamental purpose of what the National Care Service is. Um, that was a comprehensive answer. I don't know if anyone else wants to, to add to that. If not, one of... I just sure. make a point. Sure, um, I just, it, yes, it's not clear, but I, I've got concerns really that if, if we remain the employer, which we ought to, um, I hope, but if, if then terms and conditions and salary banding and grades are somehow uh, expected of us as a framework to work on, which would be a good thing if that delivers... Um, you know, a better experience for employees. My concern is that those, those, we, we wouldn't be adequately funded for all of those elements because that often doesn't happen. We don't have full re cost recovery. Uplifts over the last five years plus haven't uh, met all of our needs. And also, if there is an imposition upon us, would that somehow militate against our model, our way of doing things. You know, the, the beauty of the voluntary sector is that we've got different charisms, different ethoses, you know, our charities have, have, have different aims, different cultures. And we need to be careful that the, the kind of dead hand of bureaucracy somehow doesn't snuff out all of, all of that difference, because that difference is choice to the end user. They can make a choice. You know, whether it's Larsh and Camp Hill's particular model, whether it's Enable or Leonard Cheshire or, or anyone else. 
So I, I just I urge caution about the way in which that's implemented. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I think it's a, a point all the committees have been uh, hearing with regards to the National Care Service. My, my follow-up question was with regards to you know, progress Parliament has made, and I think collectively none of us are saying change doesn't have to happen. But when you look at the last decade, um, some of the reforms, integration of health and social care, Rachel and I both worked on health and care staffing bill, um, self-directed support we've already touched upon, um, carers' breaks within the carers' bill. Now, that hasn't necessarily all been delivered, but my question is, could this undermine these policies as well as we move towards creating a, another, uh, basically, organisation? Um, and all of that progress we want to see happen, and not necessarily it has, but it gets lost in translation. I just wondered what your view was on, on that. Richard, do you want to kick off on so that? So I think it's a risk. And one of the risks that we talked about earlier was the fact that some of these things are not explicitly mentioned or translated into the bill, particularly self-directed support, which concerns us as well. You'll see from our model of change that, that one of the things that we've put in there is that uh, principle of subsidiarity to the individual. And at the moment, what we have is a bill which is inevitably causing a great deal of tension between national and local governments. Um, uh, about control, but actually I think it should be far more radical and that's what SDS is about, because control and choice should sit with the person to manage their own life with support. And I think it goes back to Chris's point. So um, I think there is a risk. I don't know if it's insurmountable. That's the work that we're doing now, like the committees, to try and work through what could be improved. Um, but I think... The fact that the bill in itself doesn't even really make clear what happens to IJBs. We're all making some assumptions about what's going to happen, but the, you know, we, we are assuming that much of that will be repealed and that we're not going to end up with two different versions of how we manage health and social care integration. It's also interesting that I think, having also worked on the public bodies uh, bill and acts extensively, integration's hardly mentioned through this process. So there's something about what is the, and it goes back to our vision statement, what is the vision that we're looking to? And therefore, then does this bill help us get there? And I think some of the principles that have been talked about, they don't mention things like choice and control. I know um, some of the uh, DPOs are, are, are unhappy that doesn't mention the right to independent living, for example. Um, if these are the things that really matter, then we have to make sure they're reflected if this is going to be the legislation that gets us the reform that we want. Thank you. Frank. Yes, uh, I think I would agree with that. And I think the, the calls for a national care service have been building over a number of years and, and led to the Feely Review and now the, the National Care Service Bill. I think it probably reflects a frustration that those policies were not being experienced in practice. Um, you know, as I said, you know, there, there is... Uh, a lot of international um, interest in, in, in some of the policies that Scotland has and you know, Enable has been at various con conferences around Europe um, where that's been discussed and, and people from other countries will say, well, that's amazing, you've got self-directed support legislation. Says, yes, we have the legislation, but... Um, and I think that perhaps we have that um, desire through this bill and perhaps it's, it's fully, foolishly optimistic on, on my part, but I think part of the thinking behind this bill is that this is how we make all those things happen in reality. Um, you know, and perhaps you know, I don't think we want to get into finger pointing, and I don't think that's healthy. But there's perhaps a feeling that the current structures haven't worked in delivering that. And again, you know, as, as Rachel has alluded to, I know there is lots of finger pointing in various directions. You know, is the funding coming to deliver it? Is the delivery being done by the front line? You know, it's, um, there are those sort of um, questions and arguments that are always there in terms of the relationship between local government and, and national government. Um, but I think that it's recognised it's not been working for whatever reason. So if we are going to have a structure, um, a national care service structure there, that has to be the final piece of the puzzle. That has to be the solution to why these initial reforms haven't worked to date. Um, that has to be how we get to that place. So I think it's really important that those elements like self-directed support um, are baked into the bill absolutely clearly. This is what's going to make this happen, because if it doesn't, you know, we'll just move the deck chairs um, but haven't actually addressed the problem. Um, so I think it's absolutely critical that we make that at the heart of the bill. Yeah. Th thank you. And just finally, uh, convener, at Local Government Committee on Tuesday, I asked the same question. Um, we've got the minister in after yourselves. What would you say to him? Um, and I'll maybe start with Sheena. So I know you're online. We've not brought you in. 
Thank you. Um, I think from, from the last question, the, the bit for, for us and, and, and a lot of our conversations with our members and people that use services is if we have people at the centre, um, then we can make progress, I would argue, quicker and more effectively. People who use services, their family and their carers who are you know, experts in this every day, it's their daily life. If we keep them at the centre of what we're doing and not um, you know, change the language we use, but use the same processes in the same system that we know has um, a lot to improve on, um, you know, I think there's a risk we, we change the, the language and don't actually change the behaviours and the practice. And as we've heard, we have a lot of great legislation in place in Scotland, but it doesn't translate for everyone to have a great experience. And I think that's the bit that we really need to have people um, who live this daily, leading, supporting, not being consulted or in a side base, commenting on what other people are, are suggesting, but really leading and that we ask people who maybe are used to being in the decision-making spaces to, to step back a bit and, and enable people to really direct what, what they need and what they want, because they have experience of it every day that we can really listen and learn from. So that would be my plea to really enact all the great um, vision and desire to make things better, but not to try and do it by using the same processes, the same structures and the same um, power relationships that we currently have, Thank you. and that we can support each other with that. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any yeah. other points? I think uh, we, with regard to the, uh, I'd say to the Minister, let's slow things down to enable a proper Con consultation on this, so there's true co-design, and we've got to gra grasp the, the hot potato of funding. You know, no, no nation in the UK seems to be willing to do that, because it's, 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 it's eye-wateringly expensive, potentially, need not be. But we need to commit money to the sector to enable the fair, fair work to, 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 to be delivered. You know, that the report came out in 2019. And also proper funding so that uh, end users have better experiences. Oh, I've got somebody who she wants to live alone, but is repeatedly told there's no money to ena enable you, a, a young lady in your late 20s, to live alone. That's wrong. That's in unjust. The, you know, a young guy who, you know, in my previous job, um, you know, sits and stares outside of his window because his package was re reduced. You know, I mean, that, that, they're the realities. You know, as an employer, I'm having to give bridging loans to enable people to get by in life. You know, other organisations have charitable funds, etc. You know, they're the three three bits of action we need now. Thank you, Thank you Miles. Um, I'll now move on uh, to a supplementary question from James Dorden, who is joining us online. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, it was just to take. To go back to what Rachel and Frank, I think it was, were talking about, and Frank kind of answered my question, uh, where they were talking about the co-design, the problems that they had, they wanted co-design in at the, the, the front. But Frank then went on to talk about some of the issues that had happened, self-directed support, uh, et cetera. And this clearly is a way to, to try and ensure that all these things that should have been happening in the past and didn't happen very often across the country because of local authorities as opposed to national uh, government. This might be a way to make sure that there is that sort of equality of commitment across the country. And except the financial situation differs in different parts of the country, but maybe this is a way that we will be able to, to resolve that issue as well. Does, does uh, Rachel particularly not agree that we, we, we saw with the Social Security Act that the, the co-production, the co-design after this framework bill was introduced could be the way forward. Did Mr Feely certainly seemed to think so. Why is it that, that uh, you don't think so? Okay, so I'd start by perhaps not 
challenging slightly the interpretation of what I've said, but I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. I think the Social Security Bill is a very helpful model in some areas where we, we are looking at that as well in terms of some of the changes that we might want to see if the bill continues when we get to stage two, because I think it's really important to do that thinking early. So um, Frank was talking about commissioners, for example, and that's been a really interesting part of the social security legislation, um, though perhaps requiring additional resource than it has, which doesn't appear in this bill, despite the social security legislation being promoted as, a, as, a, as an important model. I think there's also a fundamental policy difference between social security and social care. And social care is an ongoing one-to-one -one relationship with people to live their life, sometimes for the entirety of their life, and it is not, it is, it's a very different place. We can't necessarily pick up a policy idea that's worked in one place and, and translate it. Now, the co-design piece, I think, is really, really important. And we are totally supportive, if we are clear what we mean, by a co-designed approach. One of the things I would say is I think some of the difficulty that this bill is finding itself in as it goes through Parliament at this point in time is that the, co the, the right co-design approach that is being promoted wasn't necessarily applied to the bill, ironically. So we have a, a bill that sets out a structure for national governance. Um, to some extent, it's not entirely clear to us exactly how that will work, and I've already said I think the co-design and co-production part that Derek Feely suggested in a national board is missing, and that's a huge omission. So one of the difficulties that we've got is, a, is almost like a timing issue, and we are where we are. This is the bill that we have, and this is what we will work with and continue to be productive with um, as long as we feel it can get us towards our, 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 our model of reform, is that the bill itself sets a, a tone which is about let's sort out the national structures first. Our point is, in our model, subsidiarity to the individual is where we would begin, and it's far more radical than whether local government or national government have the power and control. The power and control of, of self-directed support was meant to be the radical place in which control was held by people who required care and support. And actually, one of the things, I guess, that we're thinking through at this point in time is does the principle of the bill and does the structure that's being set up enable what could be, and Frank's point about being in Europe and talking about this, could be an absolute exemplar of how social care is prov provided in a way that gives dignity, choice and control. The difficulty is, because inevitably le you only legislate for certain things, because we're starting with the legislation, you can't legislate for everything, nor should you, but we've started with the legislation. So that does mean it's the process we've got and we're working with that, but some of those big unanswered questions don't give us the colour on the legislation to be sure that those specific provisions are the right ones to deliver the vision. So that's what we're trying to do now, and we're really open to working on that, to finding a way. At this point in time, though, I would say it's, there are a lot of questions unanswered that make it hard to necessarily know that each provision is exactly the right one to put choice, control and dignity to the people who are needing to be within our social care system. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that. And I'm not for a second suggesting that you didn't, you didn't support the principle of national care mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. uh, but surely what you're asking for, you've got the opportunity to to sell that, you've got the opportunity. I mean, I don't think the, the government are looking for a prescriptive method of national care service. What they're looking for is, is like what happens to the national health service if you've got ministers that are responsible, uh, being held responsible for something, then they've got to have a general overlook of what's happening in a service, which doesn't happen just now because of the breakup between national and local governments. So surely it's for you and the other organisations to to point out the failures, the ministers coming to us when you leave, some of the questions that you're asking us, I'll then be taking on your role and asking him. Mm -hmm. But the, the, surely you can see that there is an opportunity here for you to get the kind of care service that you want that will give a, a, a sort of a, a parity of esteem right across the country. So to, to come back on that, I guess I come back to my point that um, we are still doing our work just like the committees are to see if it could become what we want. You'll have seen from our response to stage one to the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee that we do have serious concerns and I'll come to the accountability point because I think it's a really important one. 
We know that, that the Minister has very explicitly said that the consultation has, he has heard very loud and clear that a majority of people who were spoken to are looking for national government accountability for social care. Fine. Okay. So that's, that's fine. But the bill then sets those accountabilities out in very specific ways. So the core accountability of ministers, which is contained really in two provisions at the very start of the bill once you've gone through the principles, are quite broad and they don't necessarily give us a clear and transparent enough sense of accountability of ministers. It's to promote a national care service which will improve the health of people or the well-being of people. And actually, I would suggest that if ministers are going to hold accountability for something with the risks of social care, with the profound consequences of people being able to be full participants in their community, those accountabilities should probably be a lot clearer than they are. And indeed, in how ministers choose to apply the principles, then basically they are choosing themselves whether they think they've applied them appropriately. One of the things that we're looking at is, is uh, we've spoken about commissioners, but there is very little in the legislation about how ministers will then go to Parliament, for example, to report on what the success criteria for this National Care Service are, and those are not yet set. And please do not misinterpret me. I am not asking for the equivalent of the heat targets for, for the NHS in social care. But there needs to be some way of saying, is this successfully helping people to live the lives they want to lead and giving people choice, control and dignity? None of that is in the bill. So if, if it's, a, it's a political decision where that accountability sits, it is not a decision for providers, it is a political decision, but if it is going to be held centrally, we need to be clear how is this being held, what that accountability is for, how it will be reported on, and how it in and of itself will solve the sorts of problems we've been talking about this morning. How will that solve the implementation gap for self-directed support? And I know I've had one provider talk to me and say, if self-directed support had done everything we'd hoped for, would we be here? And I think it's a reasonable question. So if this is about changing accountability, how will this make that better? And I am really open, as, our, as it, CCPS is really open to, to, to that being the case, but the bill itself in being so much of a framework bill doesn't yet, we think, do enough. So the question for us is, could it? And that's where we would get into that stage two discussion. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to our next theme, although there has been quite a bit of crossover, so I believe there's only one member looking to come in here. Oh, and I, you don't. My, okay. my questions have just been answered. <clears throat> Fabulous. Um, we will move on to theme three then, which is homelessness. Um, and I will first bring in my sorry, Deputy Convener, Emma Roddick. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Beth, you've been quite quiet this morning so far, so um, I'd like to pick up on some of what Crisis has already said. Um, obviously, around not including homelessness in the functions that can be transferred to the, to the National Care Service, what, in your opinion, is the impact of that? So I think we need to really think about the relationship between homelessness and social care. So 8% of the population have experienced homelessness at some point. Um, some of those people will only have needs for new accommodation, but over half of people now have support needs uh, when they come to present as homelessness, as homeless. Um, the majority of those are mental health needs, uh, independent living skills, uh, physical, and uh, physical and learning disabilities, uh, some medical needs. Most of those will sit within the remit of the National Care Service. So that's really important to, to note. We often talk about people with, with complex needs. It's not a great term, but often the needs that they have will sit at, within the centre of that triangle of homelessness, of housing, of uh, health and of social care support. Um, and we know that good housing underpins social care. Uh, we saw that in the pandemic. And social care support uh, supports good housing outcomes. And vice versa, a lack of support from social care can really exacerbate the risk of homelessness. The policy memorandum says that um, uh, house, homelessness really is, is a housing function. That seems to be the a reasoning for leaving homelessness out of the National Care Service. That kind of goes against the grain of, of homelessness policy over the last few years where we've been talking about no wrong door approaches. We've been talking particularly around homelessness prevention, uh, about the importance of shared public responsibility for preventing homelessness. And uh, 
we've talked a lot about the pressures and the difficulties in accessing social care services today, but actually we have been making progress of, of linking up homelessness and social care support through the pandemic and through the rapid rehousing transition plans over the last few years. So we're, we're a bit concerned about the, the kind of quite simplistic analysis that homelessness should sit with, with housing functions. Um, what we need to do is we need to put the experience of service users right at the centre of all of this. And what they need um, and what they want, they tell us, is a seamless service where they, they approach a service and they get what they need. We need to make sure that these changes don't create more barriers, they don't create more complexity. Um, we really need to make sure they don't create more stigma. You go to the National Care Service unless you're homeless when you go to the local authority. Um, I think it's really worth noticing that we are separating for the first time social care and homelessness from being within one public body with local accountability to being uh, homelessness in uh, one public body with local accountability and social care in a different public body with, with a different kind of accountability. And we need to make sure that those links uh, remain. So strategic planning across the board is absolutely essential to get this right. It has to be the, the experience of the uh, end user that is there at the centre. And if we don't get the functions behind that the strategic planning, the shared objectives, the interagency inter budgeting right, then that is a real risk. It's concerning that there isn't more detail about that in the policy memorandum. It's not touched on in the bill at all. There is some policy that's already out there. So Housing to 2040 has touched on some of this. So we, if we can bring some of that in, the, the work around um, shared accountability frameworks and sh shared objectives, that would be really valuable. But I think we need to go a bit beyond that. But we need to join up these policy agendas. And if we can take the learning from things like Housing to 2040 uh, into this, I think that will help. Thank you very much. And you actually answered my next question. So okay. back to you, convener. Thank you. I believe we now have a question from Foisal Choudhury, who is joining us online. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, yeah, given that uh, homeless is not included in the functions that can be transferred to the National Care Service, is it at risk of falling through the cracks? I would go back to my point about the strategic planning. We have to get that right. Uh, we, the homelessness prevention recommendations that, that are, are expected to come to Parliament this year have a strong focus on uh, strategic planning in the, in the recommendations that they made. In those proposals, that was around health and social care partnerships. So we need to look at what would that would look like under national care service plans, including what that would look like with a national health service as well as the national care service. Um, if we don't get that planning right, I think there is definitely a risk that things would fall through the gaps. Yeah. Thank you. I don't have any other question. Uh, Thank you very much. We will move to our last set of questions then, I believe, from Jer Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, I, I suppose I just want to go back a wee bit to what, again, Chris and others have been talking about, about how this co-design actually works in practice and what your expectation for is it. Is it and I, I apologise, I can't remember which one of you said, is it a consultation document that you all respond to, Scottish Government go away and do whatever they want? Or do you see it as a much more interactive way of doing it? And, and, and how would that actually work in practice? And I'll maybe start with you, Chris, because you obviously you come from not the central belt. So even for you in regard to geographical area, h how would it work... Uh, or how could you envisage it working, where there really is input, it's tested, it comes back, it's tested, and have you a time scale on how long that would actually take in practice to get to where we're ready to end, the government's ready to bring forward regulations? My, my thoughts are that, as, as I said before, Jeremy, I think the, the co-design process really ought to have started from the top to look at the objectives and the principles within, within the bill and then put that to, 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 to users and, and actually th those who, whose needs aren't currently met, carers and everyone else, and allow them to, 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 to map out and, and work with those ideas. I mean, that seems to me the sensible place and the authentic place to start in a co-design process. With regard to the process itself, 
I, th I think it would have, have to happen within um, local communities. It would have to happen with, over a dispersed area. Um, or there, there would need to be a very clear, clear and well-resourced process that could be picked up by, by providers, different community bodies, um, different authorities. And that process would need to be, as I say, well-resourced. So there'd need to be accessible materials. There would need to be consideration to, um, you know, to the, to the time rest restraints that people might have, particularly if they're, they're, they're unpaid carers, to access that. That would be need to, need to concern, would be need to, to be given to uh, the costs associated with, with that as well. Um, certainly in terms of Highland, um, you know, there's a particular sensitivity that all areas of Highland don't have an equal say and aren't always listened to. And the only, the only way really to, to, to address that would be to, to ensure that there are proper resources and adequate resources to enable the consultation process to, to reach all areas. And Beth, can I come back to you? Because in, in, in a remark previously, you said, you know, often people who are homelessness aren't even picked up in regard to this. How would you envisage it happening? And can it happen? In, in terms of... Of consultation. So if, consultation, uh, yeah. Yeah, in regard to it you know, and, and how we engage with those who don't often get the opportunity to engage in that process. I mean, I think the first thing I would say is that there's a long history of doing consultation in the homelessness sector and, and engagement. Uh, things like the Prevention Commission that informs the Homelessness Prevention Review Group, the, um, chain, the All In For Change Group as well. Um, so there is a, actually a lot out there, and we do know a lot about what people want. Um, you know... Crisis did some consultation earlier this year where people were saying we want a multi-agency approach, we want see services to be joined up from the beginning, we don't want to have to talk to lots and lots of people about the same issue over and again to get the help that we need. So there's work already done out there, there's also a lot of expertise in doing this and there are organisations who, who have that expertise. Um, we need to get to the people who... who find it very difficult to engage with services or, or find services very inaccessible and that is challenging but there are people out there with expertise so we need to draw on that okay. and then just finally Frank I don't know obviously your members how would you see it working they're engaging rather than it just being a come up spend a couple of hours then walk away and ever how do you make it more fluid Yes, uh, uh, and again, we have been involved in a, a few of the Scottish Government events um, that have been looking at um, design and ideas for national care service at the various points. Uh, a number of our members have been engaging with that, and I think the thing that strikes me at those events always is a great deal of sympathy um, for the Scottish Government teams that are running them, because you know, if, if we're trying to corral literally hundreds, if not thousands, of views um, from different people across Scotland. And some will have very different experiences uh, and very different thoughts um, about how they would like to see those systems designed. So it's certainly something that we are trying to do is to uh, try and deepen that engagement, um, because uh, I think it is, there is always the risk that that sort of format can be quite unwieldy, that it is, you know, it, we don't want it ever to be a tick box exercise, but there's always that risk. Uh, and like I said, I, I sometimes sympathise um, with the civil servants who are undertaking that, because how do you possibly come with a, you know, I think it's probably difficult to get a, a collective view from the six witnesses in this session. So I think to have a, a nationwide uh, consultation process and co-design process to come to a, an agreed end point um, is very difficult. So I think it's something that we always do um, with our members is to try and perhaps bring one of the officials in um, separately for a, a smaller group discussion. Um, and I think what's really important in that co-design is to have an evidence base to learn from what's actually working because um, I think the risk perhaps is that we have lots of new ideas um, without the capacity to implement brand new ideas and test brand new ideas um, and see what would work so I, I think uh, alongside co-design um, we do have to have that learning from evidence of, of what's already in the sector and what's already successful in the sector uh, and the experiences that people are having the good experiences that people are having of social care um, in reality um, uh, and get beyond just a collection of views and opinions to a collection of evidence um, from what already works. Thank you,
Thank you very much, Jeremy. Well, that brings us to the end of this session, and I would just like to say thanks very much to all the witnesses for joining us this morning, especially at such an early time. Um, we, we really appreciate you feeding into this. So I will briefly suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to change over. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. I now welcome to the meeting our second panel. We have Kevin Stewart, Minister for well Mental Wellbeing and Social Care, Ian Turner, Deputy Director, Adult Social Care Workforce and Fair Work, and Anna Kyniston, Deputy Director of National Care Service Programme Design, Engagement and Legislation. So I will invite the Minister to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning to you and to the committee. Uh, and thank you for having me along today uh, to give evidence to, to your committee. Uh, it's fair to say that the National Care Service is one of the most ambitious reforms of public services. It will end the postcode lottery of care provisions across Scotland and ensure that those who need it have access to consistent and high quality care uh, and support to enable them to live a full life wherever they are. The NCS Bill sets out a framework for the changes we want to make uh, and allows scope for further decisions to be made. This flexibility allows the National Care Service to develop adapt and respond to specific circumstances over time. Uh, I want to take time this morning uh, to reflect on why uh, change of this scale is necessary. Scotland's community health and social care system has seen significant incremental uh, change over the last 20 years. But despite this, people with experience of receiving care support and providing it uh, have been clear that there remains some significant issues. Uh, we're not just changing uh, to address the challenges of today. We must ensure that we build a public service fit for tomorrow. Today, about one in 25 people receive social care, social work and occupational health support in Scotland. Demand is forecast to grow and the NCS must be developed to take account of our future needs. We will build a system that is sustainable and future-proofed to take account of the changing needs of our population. The principles of any new system will be person-centred, uh, with human rights at the very centre of social care. That, this means that the National Care Service will be delivered in a way that respects, protects and fulfils the human rights of people accessing care support and their carers. Improved carer support is one of the core objectives of establishing the NCS. As part of the human uh, rights-based outcome-focused approach, carers and people with care needs will be able to access support which is preventative and consistent across Scotland. Nationally and locally, the NCS will work with specialist charity and third sector providers of social care, as well as other third sector organisations in the field of social care to meet the needs of the people. The NCS will bring changes that will benefit the workforce too. The importance of staff uh, in the social care sector has never been clearer, and we are fully committed to improving their experience as we recognise and value the work that they do. The NCS will ensure enhanced paying conditions for workers and act as an, as an exemplar uh, in its approach to fair work. Our co-design process will ensure that the NCS is built with the people that it serves and those that deliver it at its very heart. We are committed uh, to working with people with first-hand experience of accessing and delivering community health and social care to ensure we have a person-centred national care service that best fits the needs of the people who will use and work in its services. And at its very heart will be human rights. Thank you very much, convener. Thank you very much, Minister. I will start with a question of my own before I move on to questions from other members. Overall, I think it was 72 per cent of respondents who responded to the consultation on the National Care Service agreed that Scottish ministers should be accountable for the delivery of social care through a National Care Service. So I am just wondering, can the Minister advise what would be the benefits of having that accountability at a ministerial level? Um, well, I think, convener, um, in taking up this post after being asked by the First Minister uh, to take on this role uh, and to begin what I always do, which is uh, listening uh, to the voices of lived experience, what featured very highly from people, much higher than I expected, was the accountability issue. People feel um, that uh, when they 
uh, have a difficulty that often accountability is not there. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, many times myself, my officials have heard people telling us uh, their stories where things have not gone right for them and they have gone to the Health and Social Care Partnership and been told, oh, that's not our responsibility, that's the Council's responsibility, or, you know, that's the NHS's responsibility. And that's not acceptable. And what people can understand, and including members in this place at points, um, is the fact that I have and the Scottish Government has no accountability in, uh, in any of this. We set policy direction, but we are not responsible for delivering the services. But um, many of the folk around this table, many of the folk in Parliament write to me on a regular basis asking me to resolve problems that they uh, are encountering with folks in their own constituencies. Now, people believe that there should be ministerial accountability. They believe that the accountability um, at local level must be more robust. Because I think uh, for all of us who regularly deal with casework, there is absolutely nothing more frustrating than somebody coming to you with a problem, sometimes a very easy thing to resolve, which hasn't been dealt with. So, it's a, a bit of a surprise for me about how, how high up the agenda accountability uh, was for people, but it is very high indeed up their agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I'll now move to questions from Deputy Convener Emma Roddick, to be followed by questions from Paul McLennan. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, I know that you focused a bit in Health Committee on um, the order that, that this process is, is being done in with this being an enabling piece of legislation um, with the, the detail developed through a process of, of co-design and subject to, to sign off from the Parliament through secondary legislation. Um, does bringing forward enabling legislation in this way and then co-designing the systems provide more opportunity for organisations and people with lived experience to feed in? Um, Convener, I think this follows on almost perfectly from your question, um, because feedback uh, from stakeholders has made a, a number of things clear. Um, as I said, they want ministers to be accountable for the delivery of social care, and they want the voices of lived experience to be central to the shaping of the National Care Service. So having a framework bill allows us to achieve these things. The bill sets out the framework um, for the changes that we want to make uh, and the principles that will be absolutely central to the National Care Service. Um, it allows Parliament an important uh, uh, opportunity to scrutinise and influence that framework. Um, and you know, uh, that's immensely important given the scale uh, of all of this. And it also gives us the ability uh, to gradually build what is required uh, with consultation and listening to people to come up with the right secondary legislation that is adaptable and flexible as we move forward. Um, and all the way through this process, we have to ensure that in terms of co-design and in terms of building the service, that we have people at the very heart. Uh, I've spoken already this morning about the incremental change that there has been over the past two decades or so. Um, but one of the things which is very definitely the case um, is that in doing that uh, with the best of intentions, there are still implementation gaps. So we have made moves, but we still have gaps in services. Uh, and what we need to do is to plug those gaps. Sometimes uh, some folk out there would argue that some of those gaps are not gaps but gaping chasms. Uh, but we must ensure that we plug those gaps. And the best way of doing that is actually listening to people all the way through this journey in order that we get this absolutely right. And the, the alternative uh, to that would, would presumably be bringing detail forward and then asking people to respond to it, would that allow the same consultation and the same co-design to, to happen? No, I don't think so, um, because we've done it that way for so many other things before. 
Um, and you know, the government has been quite clear um, that we will ensure um, that those that uh, currently require uh, care and support, carers, the workforce, needs to be at the heart um, of the shaping of this new service. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, in terms of those voices of lived experience, um, you know, if you talk to many folks, they have gone through lots and lots of other processes in the past, which has not worked for them. And we need to make sure um, that we get it right this time. This is the greatest opportunity in terms of listening, of consultation um, and uh, of co-design. Um, and, you know, if, if nothing else, one of my big ambitions here is to remove as many of those implementation gaps as we possibly can. And in order for us to do so, I think this is the right way. Thank you. And just a final question around this theme. I think in this committee, we've always been very aware that we do ask people to come and give very personal uh, testimonies and that can be quite difficult to do mm -hmm. and to believe that it's going to then result in change. Um, would there have been any danger in doing the co-design first of then not having that parliamentary approval and things not actually ending up the way that those who fed in expected it to? Well, again, I think if you were to talk to some of the voices of lived experience, people from the Social Covenant Steering Group, others that we have uh, talked with and listened to uh, 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 since uh, we began this, uh, you know, they would argue um, that the framework is the right way to go, because if we started the co-design process without the framework, they could put in all of that effort and then find all of that wasted. And I think if you, again, if you talk to some of the, the very active people um, in social care, if you talk to uh, disabled people's organisations, for example, you know, they have been involved in things previously, thinking that that was going to lead to change, and it hasn't done so. So the framework has to be there. Um, in order that we can do uh, the next part of the work in terms of the co-design. Um, and, you know, others have argued, you know, you could have done it the other way around. I don't think that that would have worked. But even if we'd done it the other way around, I don't think that many of the folk with lived experience would have necessarily had the confidence uh, and participated to the degree that we want to without that framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move now to questions from Paul McLennan, to be followed by Foisal Chowdhury, who is joining us online. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, witnesses have told us that, uh, some witnesses have told us that urgent reforms can and don't need to wait for the National Care Service to be established. To what extent is establishing the National Care Service a key conditioning to improving social care? And just an expansion on that as well. We asked the witnesses on the last session, basically asking around about how can Scottish Government ensure the process of creating the National Care Service doesn't destabilise existing services at this time of transition? Um, Convener, I, I thank Mr McLennan for the question, and I, I think it's a very important one, uh, particularly um, given uh, what we have gone through over the past two years with the pandemic, uh, but also what we're going through now uh, with the cost of living crisis and the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, and for many things, we don't have to wait for the National Care Service. Um, and the government uh, are uh, working with others at this moment to make improvements. Um, so let me give you examples. Um, there are a lot of things that we can do in the here and now to improve, uh, and we are taking action to do so. Uh, we've committed to increasing spend on social care um, during the uh, this Parliament, 25% by the end of the parliamentary term, and that helps lay the groundwork for National Care Service. In April, as you know, uh, we uh, set the minimum early rate uh, for providing direct adult social care to £10.50 an hour, the second pay rise that there was in a year. Um, the government has also uh, transferred £200 million to local government to support investment in social care, including to deliver that uplift. 
Um, and we are also uh, working with COSLA at this moment uh, to pro progress fair work in the sector. Um, the Fair Work and Social Care Group has developed a set of recommendations uh, for minimum standards for terms and conditions reflect, reflecting those fair work principles. And that will look at uh, things like uh, improving the rates of maternity and uh, paternity pay uh, and sick pay. Um, and of course, we're doing a lot with partners to try and assist in recruitment uh, and retention. So, there are a lot of things going on. Um, I agree with those folks who say that we cannot afford to wait for National Care Service to make movement in some of these areas, and we won't. Um, and we will continue uh, as we move forward to make the right investments to build um, uh, our social care system here in Scotland and to ensure um, that we do our level best for the social care profession. Just on the, just the, the second point, I suppose, Minister, really just was talking around about, I suppose, process, transition to the National Care Service. What can we do to try and assist organisations going through the process as, as we move towards the National Care Service? Well, as we move forward uh, with incremental change, we have to continue to listen to organisations. Now, um, I, I'm very pleased that you've had this morning already a number of, of organisations uh, here today so that you can hear firsthand some of the things that they, they want to see. Um, and, you know, their voices are required in terms of that co-design too. Um, I've talked about the expertise of those with lived experience, but there's also the expertise um, of those folks who work in the front line, of the third sector, um, of uh, many, many groups, including those disability, disabled persons organisations that I mentioned earlier too. Uh, and that is what we pledge to do. We pledge to listen as we go along. Now, let's be honest, um, co-design will have to be done within parameters, but people understand that. Um, and people also understand you know, that certain things um, are maybe not achievable. But I have got faith um, in people uh, to bring their views to the table and help us make the right decisions as we move forward. Thanks, Minister. Just, just, I just want to expand a little bit on that because I, that was, this was kind of moving on to the, my next question. But you, you've really obviously focused quite rightly on, on lived experience and it's, it, it's, it's in ensuring that people with lived experience are part of that co-design process. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you can say a wee bit more around, around about that because I think that's the, the incredibly important part. And, and if just expand a little bit on that because I think that's really important. Well, we want as many folk as possible to get involved in uh, lived experience experts panels. We want um, other stakeholders to get involved in the stakeholder groups. Um, we're at some of the early stages of this um, uh, convener, but uh, just last week, for example, I uh, attended an event which was looking at the Charter of Rights and Responsibilities uh, and how we established that. I think that was an extremely positive meeting. And I'm not saying that there weren't uh, negativities there, because there always are. But um, if we go forward uh, in the spirit uh, that that meeting was held, where you know there was a level of trust around about what we were doing, um, and people felt that they could contribute, then we're going to be doing very, very well. Um, and that is what I want to see across the board. So just on that, I mean, I think from my own point of view, I think that would be very, very useful if we could be kept aware of you know, the lived experience panels as they, as they develop, because I think that's an incredibly important part. In that um, forward, so. we, we can easy, easily do that, convener, and keep the uh, committee and parliament up to date around about how we're getting on uh, with all of these. At the moment, in terms of the lived experience expert panel, um, there have been 400 registrations. Um, I want that to be much higher. Um, and we will do all that we can to boost that. Um, and of course, there is also the stakeholder register that I uh, have already mentioned to you. But I want as many people as possible to play a role in helping us with this. Uh, and beyond that, beyond the lived experience panels, beyond the stakeholder groups, um, you, I uh, will continue to do what I have always done, and that is to go out and about and to listen. Because you know uh, that 
is the essential element in all of this. And sometimes, you know, um, you'll go out, folk will come up with a simple solution for something, uh, which has never happened or happens in one place and not another. Um, and what we need to do, um, and again, this is in the here and now, is to make sure that we're exporting the best practice that exists right across the country. And we're quite a small country, but sometimes we have not done that particularly well. And NCS gives us that opportunity to, to do better in that too. But that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be doing that in the here and now. Okay, Minister, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. We'll now move to questions from Foisal Toji to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, the, my question is, uh, this committee has heard and I'm sure many individual MSPs have heard that there are pressing issues facing care right now that cannot wait for the National Care Service. Is all reform of the, sec uh, of the sector on hold while this bill is being considered? Um, I think, Convener, I've made it quite clear that for many of these issues, we can't wait for National Care Service. And that's why um, the government at this moment in time uh, has invested in the sector two pay rises in a year. Um, and, you know, as I highlighted earlier, uh, we recognise that there is much that we could and should be doing now, and we are. Joint work with COSLA in terms of advancing that fair work agenda, that will that is happening, that is ongoing now. Uh, we recognise the pressures that are out there at this moment, and why, that's why we've uh, invested money to combat what we will face over the course of this winter. Um, so some folk have accused us of uh, our concentration of efforts uh, being on the National Care Service, and you know this is the third committee I've been at in a fortnight, and it may seem that way to folk from outside, but you know myself, um, and the Cabinet Secretary, um, Hamza Youssef, on a day and daily basis, um, are dealing uh, with the here and now. Um, you heard earlier on uh, from Rachel Kakeet. You know, Rachel will tell you that she's been involved in a, a number of meetings over the past uh, couple of weeks uh, with folks from right across the sector to make sure that we are advancing um, uh, in terms of trying to reduce delayed discharges and, of course, making sure that we are in the best possible stead as we move into winter. Uh, and that is going to be a tough winter uh, for um, social care, for the National Health Service, but we must do all that we can to make uh, as, as many mitigations as we possibly can in order uh, that we get uh, as best we can over that period in time. Thank you. Thank you. Move to Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Uh, good morning, Minister, and good morning to your team. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, we don't often get consensus amongst uh, panellists, but I did ask one question both last week and this week in regard to the, the Charter and the legal status of that Charter. And at the moment, it has no legal, char it's no legal status. And in your answer to um, a previous question, you said accountability is really important, yep. and that as a minister and as um, Scottish Government, you can be held accountable. Would it not give a greater weight to that if the Charter had legal status? And what's the thinking of not giving it legal status at this time? Um, Convener, um, I thank Mr Balfour for his question. Uh, the purpose of the Charter is to ensure that everyone knows their rights and understands their rights and responsibilities and what to expect from the future National Care Service. Um, and uh, also the Charter will provide the information uh, on the process available for upholding those rights. And the forthcoming uh, Scottish Human Rights Bill will uh, underpin in statute human rights in Scotland. Uh, and we're working across government to ensure that co-design work taking place now uh, will reflect the contents of that future bill. The intention 
um, is to include information uh, on the NCS complaints and redress system, uh, which will pr provide the necessary recourse uh, if the rights in the Charter are breached. Uh, and that will provide a clear pathway, I think, to empower people to claim their care-specific rights through raising awareness of those rights uh, and how to bring a complaint should those rights not be met. But just to please you a wee bit, Madam Minister, if they were legally enshrined, they would then be at least the opportunity, if there was, if someone felt there had been a major breach of those, to take to, 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 to take judicial review against those. My understanding is, without that legal basis, that is not there for an individual to do. But there are other ways uh, in, that folk can get redress, uh, Mr. Balfour. Uh, and again, you know, I would point out um, that in terms of that complaints and redress system, which are really important for people, uh, we need to ensure that we listen to people on that front too. Um, and we will listen to folk during the course of the co-design work in order that we get that right. Again, you know, um, in some regards, some aspects of complaints and redress system work well, according to people. Others do not. Uh, and what we need to do is to look from uh, the bottom up how we need to make the change in order that people actually feel that they are being listened to, that their complaints are dealt with appropriately, uh, and there is the right redress there. So again, I would say to Mr Balfour, to the committee, you know, in this work that we are doing, we will listen to what folk have to say. We will listen to them about the pitfalls and where it's gone wrong for them in the past uh, and build uh, a system that is right and works for all. Uh, thank you. Uh, the other question, just on this particular area. Um, I think particularly last week, but to some extent this week, there was a view that you know, we've come through the pandemic. There's a lot going on, yep. as you've hinted at. Yep. And actually, the, the opportunity, the breadth for people to actually engage in this, particularly maybe those with lived experience, is going to be difficult. Have you given any thought? I think everyone recognises the short-term and long-term reform is required. But in regard to the long-term, to give a bit of breathing space to allow people to get through the next year, a couple of years, without having to then engage in that consultation, because we simply don't have the energy or the time to do that. So you end up actually missing people, not because they don't want to, but simply because of what has happened in the last number of years. We're going to make it as easy as possible for folk to engage. And, you know, we'll continue to listen uh, again um, around about the barriers that may exist for engagement. But I can't stress this enough. For many individuals with lived experience, for many organisations, uh, particularly some of the disabled people's organisations, they want this change yesterday, basically. That is the fact. Um, and I think, you know, COVID shone a light uh, on some of the areas where we do not do well for people, uh, and they want to see change now. For many activists uh, with lived experience, they have been seeking change for sometimes 20, 30, 40 years. And I better not name any individuals, because I might get into trouble for being ageist. <laughs> um, but you know, a lot of folk have been at this a long time and have put a lot of work, a lot of graft, into trying to get the change that they think is necessary. Um, these folks um, really want this done now. Um, they don't want any more delay. They want movement now. Now, as I say, there are things that we're doing in the here and now um, to improve things, but they want to see that change. Um, and I have to say, um, we are not seeing many folk shying away from engagement. And that engagement, you know, doesn't have to be in terms of 
the lived experience experts panel either. You know, at my officials, myself, you know, uh, have gone out um, and engaged with people um, right across the country, and we'll continue to do that as we move forward too. And we will take the snippets and the suggestions from uh, everything that we pick up on a day-to-day -day basis, um, as well as you know, uh, looking to the suggestions, the comments uh, from the lived experience panels, the stakeholder groups, etc. Uh, thank you. I'll come back in a moment on co-design, but I'll leave it there at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move now to Pam Duncan Glancy. Um, thank you, Convener, and good morning to the Minister um, and your officials. Thank you for, for answering the, the question so far. Um, I am I, pleased to hear that you that you've referred to the fact that, that we can't wait to, to do some of this now. Um, and I'm not surprised at all to hear that disabled people and their organisations are, are urging you to are, are urging change as soon as possible. And it's I, you know, this goes. I can I remember being involved in asking this government to address social care um, 15 years ago. So um, to say it's been incremental change in that time is probably an understatement. Um, what, there are a number of problems right now. So disabled people are having to choose between whether they're getting so few hours of care and support. They're choosing between whether to go shopping with those hours, to pay their bills with those hours, like with someone with them to help them go and pay their bills, I should be clear, um, or, or to have a shower. That is, the, that is the reality that disabled people are facing right now. Carers who are working in the sector are living on poverty pay. You've mentioned that the, the Minister has mentioned there have been two pay increases. Um, that has not been enough. Um, people are leaving the sector to go and work in supermarkets because um, the pay there is, is better, and that is leaving people without care and support they need. So which parts of the, the problems I've just outlined is the Minister going to address now, rather than wait till the National Care Service is developed? Well, as uh, I said earlier, uh, I uh, have the responsibility for policy direction at this moment. Um, and, you know, some folk probably think, why would the government want accountability uh, for some of these deli delivery aspects. I have to say that I get very frustrated. Um, and I think members get very frustrated when they write to me and I say, you know, um, this is a ma matter for the local authority, for the Health and Social Care Partnership. So we do need that change. Um, and I think, you know, there are a number of things uh, where I think, uh, you know, we need to make major change in terms of delivery. And that's why the national high quality standards that will be in play, place are so important. But I kind of put those quality standards in place now because I don't have the power to do so. But the bill and what we're doing will give us that opportunity. Um, like you, uh, Ms Duncan Glancy, I get these kinds of stories on a fairly regular basis. It is annoying and frustrating for me, but even more annoying and frustrating uh, for those folks that have to make those choices. Uh, and we have to move away from uh, some of the things which we do now, which actually are not beneficial to anyone. Uh, we must move to much more preventative care, um, and we must ensure that that's person-centred, uh, recognising the needs of people. Um, and, you know, uh, we talk about person-centred care a lot now, but that does not happen in certain places. Um, and you have the situation, as you're well aware, of postcode lotteries, where in some parts of the country, some people are very well served, uh, but in others, they are not. And we can't have that either. And NCS gives us the opportunity to rid ourselves of those postcode lotteries. Uh, in terms of... Uh, paying conditions, because this is important. And it's not just paying conditions, um, it's also career pathways that are lacking, uh, which means that it is often difficult to particularly entice young people um, into uh, the care profession. We've got to change that. Opportunities there. Um, and of course, uh, what NCS gives us is the opportunity for national sectoral bargaining. Um, and the fact that that hasn't existed means that, you know, we have that low pay situation that has existed for a long time. I would say to the committee that in terms of pay, 
um, adult social care pay, we are paying more here than any other part of the UK um, at this moment. Uh, and we will continue to look at all of this as we move forward, because fair work has to be at the heart of this too. Uh, this is about changing services for people, but also uh, it is about recognising uh, a workforce and valuing a workforce that often feel at the moment that they haven't been uh, valued. Uh, and I'll say one final thing, um, convener, because we've, I've talked about that move away from crisis to prevention in terms of care, which is extremely important. Crisis actually costs the public purse a huge amount of money. But there's also that human cost of not getting it right for folk. And I think making that shift with those high quality standards can make a real difference in terms of savings to the public purse, stop some of the things that have happened to folks which shouldn't have. Uh, and, you know, those savings we then can put in to the system to continue that work. I, I think, finally, as I think I've said finally twice, a bigger pardon, convener. Uh, I, I hate when folk do that myself. So, um, uh, the, the, the other uh, aspect here um, for me is also about freedom and autonomy for staff, for frontline staff. Because where frontline staff have freedom and autonomy now, we're seeing much better service delivery. Uh, and the prime example of that is in my own home city in Aberdeen. And I, I'm sorry for boring some of the folk that were at the committee on Tuesday, but um, Granite, uh, the Granite Care Consortium there, their care at home staff have the ability uh, to step up and step down care. Obviously, in consultation with the person that's being cared for and their families, and as you can imagine, there'd be more stepping up than stepping down. But giving them that ability uh, means that folk are not reaching those crisis points. And beyond that, you know, that obviously has an impact in stopping folk you know, requiring additional services or maybe even being hospitalised. Thank, I thank the Minister for that answer. And the problems that, that have been outlined around postcode lotteries and the need for a, a real um, national uh, approach to, to what people can expect are, are not new. Um, and I share the characterisation um, of, of those concerns. I don't, however, share the characterisation of government saying that they don't have any accountability or responsibility for this. I don't think it is the case that people who receive services for social care and people who work in social care can or should be expected to have to go to multiple doors and multiple agencies to get answers on this. Um, I'm afraid I do actually think that the, the buck does stop with the Minister. Um, and so I hope that the in the here and now, there will be a mechanism for people to be um, to, to hold sy the system to account, but also um, in the future. The other um, point I want to make on, on that, and, and I'll get to a question on it as well, is um, I'm pleased that the sectoral bargaining was raised, but there's nothing in the bill about that whatsoever, and that is giving serious concerns to trade unions, to third sector organisations, to various people across the sector. Um, so it would be good to hear if there will be a commitment to collective bargaining on the bill um, going forward. Um, I thank Ms Duncan Glancy again. And in terms of the accountability aspect, I'm not, Scottish ministers are not accountable for service delivery. You know, a lot of folk out there think we are, but we are not accountable Forgive for service delivery. Forgive me, the Scottish ministers are accountable for what, what you direct um, local government to do and the money that you put into local government and the work that, that you have um, in, in social care. I don't think it's fair to characterise it that, that you don't have any response or the minister doesn't have any responsibility. I, I don't have any responsibility for service delivery. We have responsibility for policy direction. You're right in terms of resourcing. Uh, but, you know, one of the things which we uh, have not done um, is direct local government uh, health and social care partnerships. You know, we have removed ring fencing uh, from uh, uh, from the local government landscape to a huge degree, um, which local government has asked for. Um, uh, you know, there are things which you know I know are my responsibilities, but I am not accountable for service delivery, and that is something that the public out there find it quite hard to believe. But we are not. And that's one of the reasons for this change and, and ensuring that we are, that ministers have that accountability and that we get that accountability right at a local level as well, 
because people don't feel that that is necessarily right at this moment either. Um, and your other point about sectoral bargaining. Sectoral bargaining is extremely uh, important. It doesn't necessarily need to be in the bill itself. However, um, we are working closely um, with uh, stakeholders and with unions around about how we move all of this in the future. Uh, and I want to, you know, push uh, the, uh, the, the the boundaries in all of this. Um, you know, we uh, in this Parliament don't have powers over employment, but we must ensure that we get this right. Uh, bargaining is one of the key elements of getting this right. Um, and again, we need to engage and listen to colleagues uh, on the front line with trade unions, uh, and I hope local government will come to the table. I'm sure the third sector will. Um, we need to get this right for folk. I have always talked about care as a profession. If you go back long before I got this job to speechifying I made from the back benches, I talk about the care profession. But many folk don't see it that way for the simple reason that it has traditionally uh, been an area of work with low pay and often very poor conditions. And we have to change that. We have to build that workforce. Uh, and we have to build that workforce for the future. Uh, and what I want to see um, is that profession becoming attractive to young people. And if it doesn't become attractive to young people, then it's not sustainable as we, as we go forward. So we must get all of these elements absolutely right. Thank you, um, and I appreciate that, Minister. Um, Convener, I have one final question, and, and you won't need to come back round to me if I, if I ask it now. Um, the, it, it, I'm pleased to hear that sectoral bargaining is, is on the agenda, um, and I would press the Minister to, to give a, an absolute commitment to that going forward, because I know that there are a number of people seriously concerned about fair work actually going backwards um, as a result of this process um, rather than forward. So um, a, a, a firm commitment on that would be really helpful. Um, I'm also uh, keen to know one person's um, kind of view of a framework and flexible bill can be another person's um, view that there is no detail and, and people can't actually have any confidence in what, um, what it's going to deliver. So one of the areas I'm interested in um, is around human rights and there are two specific rights in the bill, neither of them are about um, Article 19 of the UNCRPD. And I've heard what the Minister said about the Human Rights Bill coming forward, but we cannot have a situation in Scotland where we have one overarching Human Rights Bill that governs everything um, and all the services. We, we have to also look at how we implement that through different parts of government, including the National Care Service. So will the Minister commit to putting independent living on the face of the bill? And how does the Minister Im imagine human rights to be delivered for the people who use the service and the people who work in it going forward? Um, a number of complex things there. First of all, let me uh, say we are fully committed to fair work. Um, I have a very strong desire to make sure that we get all of this right. Um, I uh, probably should declare an interest. I've got two nieces who work in social care, um, one of whom who uh, is on maternity leave at this moment, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but very nearly did not get maternity pay. Um, and in the 21st century, um, that's unacceptable. Um, so, you know, I want to make sure that we get it right for the workforce, uh, a workforce that in the main is majority women. Um, and, you know, some of these things, as I say, in terms of maternity pay, paternity pay, we need to move now uh, with the cooperation of COSLA and others. Um, but, you know, for the other pay and conditions aspects, NCS gives a huge opportunity. Uh, in terms of your question uh, around about human rights uh, and how we handle this uh, in terms of the intergovernment working, if you like, making sure um, that legislation connects, um, you know, we are constantly talking uh, across government about how we get these things right. In terms of uh, ensuring that we get it right for people, that the human rights is at the very heart of all of this. We need to continue to li listen to folks themselves around about where they think 
that their rights and their needs are not being met. Uh, and again, uh, the co-design process gives us that ability uh, in order uh, to make sure that all we are doing covers as many bases, um, if not all bases, that we can uh, to, to do our level best for, for folks. Human rights is extremely important in all of this. Uh, is, as I said, at the heart of what we're doing here. Um, and, you know, I think, again, we need to continue to, to listen to folk around about what we need to do in that front. Um, have I missed something? I've got um, a feeling I've I, missed I something. I think the, the bit about independent living on the bill, and actually um, Jim, Dr Jim Elder Woodward has um, prepared a paper, um, as I'm sure you'll be aware, because um, he, he, he's a, a good promoter of this work. Um, and in that, I think he actually sets out various different ways and um, means that the bill could um, make clearer what human rights of the people who will use the service will be. Would, you be, would the minister be prepared to look at the structure that Dr Woodward has outlined and, and embedding that into the framework in the bill and including independent living on it? Um, as always, uh, convener, and I maybe get a sound a little bit flippant and maybe uh, uh, Dr Jim Elder Woodward will have a pop at me later. Um, I've got no option whatsoever uh, but to listen to Jim. And whatever uh, Jim puts forward, you know, I will always look at and will always consider. Um, uh, Dr Elder Woodward uh, serves on the Social Co Covenant Steering Group, as the committee may or may not be aware. Um, he has been uh, a very strong voice uh, for disabled people's rights uh, for a very, very, very long time. Um, and, you know, I give the commitment to Ms Duncan Glancy that, uh, you know, whatever Jim puts forward, we will look at and consider. I don't think I have an option. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move now to questions from General May Balfour, who has some questions around co-design. Yeah, uh, thank you, Minister. I mean, some of this has been explored, but I just want to cover two areas that were brought up in today's evidence. Um, if the bill is passed by Parliament and you then do the co-design around the regulations and guidance that would then come out of that, have you, within your own mind, a timescale for that period of consultation, drawing up the regulations, bringing them forward? Are we, have, you, have you in your mind, in your official's mind, you know, a, a kind of timeline for that, of when these regulations would then come back to Parliament for them to be scrutinised? Um, convener, I think it would be a bit daft of me to to commit to timelines um, at this moment uh, on any of these aspects for the simple reason, um, you know, I've highlighted uh, that we want to have the voices of lived experience and stakeholders at the very heart of all of this. And obviously, you know, co-design work can go on forever. But at the same time, you've got to give people the ability uh, to feel that the time that they're taking is right. And also, it would be wrong of me um, to um, you know, give any indication around about timelines uh, in terms of secondary legislation, because that's a matter um, for Parliament rather than for me. But what I would say um, to the committee um, is that I want to give folks the ultimate opportunity, including Parliament, the ultimate opportunity to scrutinise what we're doing in order to get that secondary um, legislation uh, right. Um, and I know um, uh, that uh, you know, sometimes um, parliamentary processes themselves um, you know, can be onerous, but it's it's not up to me to decide those timelines. If you want some more technical aspects um, of the process, I'm happy for uh, Ms Kyniston to come in, but I think it would be daft of me to, to commit to timelines, many of which I would have no say over anyway. Well, it's your decision, because it's when 
Scottish Government Labour regulations in Parliament the time school then starts. So, yeah. to the extent you know, it's not for this committee of Parliament to scrutinise anything so, until you're brought forward. So, you are the ultimate person that starts. For, you may not decide how long it takes, but you start the, the starting gun. If I can put it that way, I'm off that, and I just wondered if that had been anything you considered. I suppose the other issue around this is ultimately the final decision of the regulations that Parliament would scrutinise will be yours. So co-design can take us so far, but ultimately the decision of what is decided by Parliament is yours. And I just also just wonder, with using so much regulations. One of the um, frustrations for MSPs of whichever party is that we can't amend regulations. You either have to say yes to them all or no to them all. And I wonder, as well as engaging with stakeholders and how much engagement do you see happening with members of the Scottish Parliament around these regulations. So will they come to committee as drafts before you leave them, or will they, be, and what, or will they simply come as that is it? Um, convener, uh, again, uh, <coughs> you know, um, I'm not going to commit either way to drafts or not at this moment. But what I will say, as always, um, you know, I want to be um, as cooperative and collaborative in all of this work as I possibly can be. Uh, not only with the voices of lived experience, not only with the stakeholders, not only uh, with uh, local government, uh, not only with the third sector, but also with Parliament. Um, the Framework Bill um, is similar to um, the Framework Bill uh, that was used to create the National Health Service. This is a big piece of work, as I said, the pr probably the biggest reform. I want there to be cooperation and collaboration right across the board. And I know that there are going to be areas where we're going to agree, and I know that there are going to be areas where uh, we're going to disagree, um, sometimes to a great degree. Uh, but I, as always, will have my door open and will uh, do whatever is required to get that ultimate amount of cooperation. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, for a number of you who have worked with me previously, you'll know that that's the case. Absolutely. I would absolutely confirm that. I, I think there is no doubt that, certainly with the planning bill, there was a very good relationship between yourself and um, those of us that were interested in it. My final question, you'd be glad to hear, Minister, for tonight, today, is around the IGB boards. And obviously, again, there's nothing within the primary legislation we have at the moment. How do they fit into this? Will, will they need reformed, or is it how, which area do they fit in around that? So we have said that we will um, form uh, local care boards. Um, and again, you know, this is a matter for the co-design process. Um, you know, people have been trying to get me to say who should be on care boards, for example. Uh, and there are some very obvious uh, folk that should be. Uh, but this is a matter, really, for the co-design process. What I will say, um, and that is the one thing that I am very adamant about, is that the voices of lived experience should be on care boards and should have voting rights, uh, which in many places they have not had before. And obviously, um, there are people who are likely um, or will definitely be there, uh, but elected members from local authorities, you know, trade unions, em employees, and you know, the list goes on. But it's not for me uh, to, to dictate who should be on those care boards. That has to be part of the co-design process as well. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, Thank in terms of uh, cooperation, uh, you know, uh, I, I think Mr. Balfour gives a very good example in terms of the work that he did um, uh, and I did uh, with others, um, including uh, some past members on the planning bill around about changing places' toilets. 
you know, that has changed the dynamic, not only in terms of planning and building standards terms, but also um, in how uh, we continue to enhance and improve that. Now, that kind of work um, is Parliament at its best, I think, and I hope that we can achieve exactly the same thing uh, with all or most aspects of this NCS bill. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Absolutely, Minister. I think all of us round the table want, want to achieve that. I will now bring a question in from Paul McLennan. Yeah, thank you, Convener. It's really just around about, again, on the human rights issue. It just, it, last week, yeah, Minister, we heard around about some people saying people's rights were removed during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I'm just wondering how you think the bill will prevent that happening again, and is the bill necessary to prevent that happening? Again, that's probably. I think it was around about probably the care homes issues that was kind of brought up in, the, in that context. So, we're absolutely committed to uh, using the learning from the pandemic so that people are supported to see and spend time with the folks who are important to them. Uh, I know uh, that Mr. McLennan um, has had a lot of dealings um, with members of the care home. Uh, relatives group, um, as have I over the piece, and you know some of the stories that we've all heard are very, very harrowing indeed, um, and that's why Anne's law uh, is included in the uh, in the bill itself to support the rights of people living in adult care homes to remain connected even in outbreak, outbreak situations. Um, and over the piece, um, you know, we have done a, a lot of work, um, and uh, the committee will know that I'll, I'll, I've already changed regulations around about this. Um, talking to the care inspectorate yesterday, um, and I speak to them every month or so, uh, there have been no complaints since their last report around about f uh, folks not being able. Uh, to see relatives, and uh, long may that continue. And that shows that that change of regulation has helped dramatically. But you know, this is one of the areas which we need to get right in terms of that primary legislation, um, and it will give ministers the right to issue visiting directions to care home providers to comply um, with the directions that have been given. Um, I'm quite sure. Um, that this is one of the areas of the bill um, that the public at large will have a great interest in, um, particularly um, some of the folks, all of the folks um, from the Care Home Relatives Group that I know that uh, Mr McLennan and others have been engaging with us have I. Thanks, Minister. I, I was going to move on to, to the next theme, if that's OK, convenient, because I think that's the next question as well. And, and it's really just talking in about, because obviously we're talking in the context of just now about care users, carers and the workforce, but it's really just talking about the, the broader societal impact that, that this bill will have in, in terms of that. So I, I don't know if you want to expand on that, because I think that's not something we've kind of gone on. It's almost wrapped around about the bill, but I just wondered if you want to expand a little about where you see the broader society impact of the, the bill coming forward. No, this could have a huge impact, um, I think, in terms of um, the way people think uh, around about care. Um, and, you know, I think we have the ability, uh, as I said in earlier answers, uh, to create a profession where we can attract people. Um, I probably at that point should expand uh, in terms of the career progression aspect. Because sometimes we don't make it easy um, for people um, to, to change, to swap, uh, to be flexible in their careers. So sometimes it's not so easy to move from care to social work or to the health service. Um, and I think, especially talking to young folk who are working in care at this moment, um, that's a frustration for them. Um, and I think. You know, getting that right, building those opportunities, attracting younger folk to the care profession could have a real change um, in thinking and culture around about care. So, you know, I think that's one impact. Beyond that, um, you know, the other great opportunity here, and we 
um, are very much trying to change um, their way of thinking. You know, a lot of people out there feel um, that they are seen as a burden because they require care. We shouldn't be seeing that. And the investment that we are making in care um, is for the greater good of our society as a whole. So to give you the example, in, in terms of language, I, I myself don't like the term respite very much. And that's why we are talking about short-term breaks and what, one of the reasons why that right to short-term term breaks is very much part of this bill. So I think we've got a lot of changes that can take place uh, with us. Uh, and you know that is always the case. Uh, discussions around about uh, big pieces of work like this often get folks thinking a lot differently. Thanks, Mr. Can we now no quick questions on the next team? But if you want to bring another people in, no, I can come back in if, if need. I will do. Thank you, Paul. I'll now move to questions from Miles Briggs to be followed by Foysel Chowdhury. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister, and to your officials as well. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of specific questions, and it relates back to some questions we've already heard. And so I wondered specifically, and the Minister said he wants to listen to folks where their rights and needs are not being met, why the right to independent living isn't on the face of the bill. And given the concerns and issues around self-directed support across Scotland, policy we all agree with, why that's not really front and centre of sure. making sure we get that working properly. So self-directed support, um, a big bugbear for me, uh, I have to say, uh, and probably a bugbear for many of the folk uh, around the table today. Uh, because again, that was a piece of legislation which had cross-party support, um, all done for the best of intentions, uh, all in primary legislation. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, folk out there um, have not stuck with the spirit of the legislation, but have had tried to find flaws, loopholes in the legislation to deny people their rights in terms of self-directed support. And again, we see a postcode lottery uh, across the country um, in terms of folks' ability to access self-directed support. That's not good enough. Um, and you know, I've had folk working uh, over uh, a fairly lengthy period now in terms of uh, changing the guidance, which I think we publish in the next couple of weeks, new guidance in self-directed support. And that will be helpful in some regards and teasing out some of the difficulties are out there, but it won't do it all. And, you know, it's one, this is one of the reasons why I think that a lot of what we're doing in terms of secondary legislation is important, because it means that we can be flexible and adaptable if, you know, we have not got it quite right uh, in terms of the legislation itself, whereby, you know, in order to change a piece of primary legislation, uh, often there's not the legislative vehicle to do it, um, and often that takes a very long time. So flexibility and adaptability um, is the key thing there. Um, you know, I'm not ruling out uh, at all um, putting independent living uh, in the face of the bill. However, uh, what I want to do um, is to listen to the likes of the Jim Elder Woodwards of this world and others um, around about what is required here um, and what do we actually need um, to achieve out of all of this. And is that best done in primary legislation or is that best done in sec secondary legislation where there is more flexibility and adaptability? But you, Ms <coughs> Duncan Glancy, can be assured that we will look at what we get from folks like Jim and a lot of others um, and we will listen uh, and we will consider and move accordingly. Thank you for that. And that's helpful because I think for those of us who want to make sure self-directed support is not lost in translation in the bill, um, part can, of that is... Can, 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 sure I, can, I, I, can I expand on that? And I'm sorry, uh, you know, where self-directed support works well, it can be absolutely a life changer 
for people, for their families, for their carers. Um, and there are some immense stories about where self-directed support has made real differences to folks' lives. Uh, and there are parts of the country where um, flexibility has been brought into play um, because people have been listened to um, and, you know, doing something a little bit differently for someone which will make a huge odds to them is the right thing to do. But, you know, in other parts of the country, there's a closing down in terms of options that are available. Um, we have a situation, of course, where um, uh, there are different payments and different... And I spent the summer uh, going around the country asking about SDS and various other things. And, you know, there are stark differences. Um, and we have to end that postcode lottery. And, you know, I am very much in favour um, of ensuring that we give folk as much independence and autonomy here as we possibly can. Thank you. Uh I wanted to look at, and we've heard in the first panel, with regards to the diverse fabric of the social care sector, mm -hmm. um, different models, interconnectivity between mm -hmm. the NHS, councils, housing associations, mm -hmm. employability services, etc. Um, but I wanted to focus on homelessness, because that's not going to be necessarily transferred, and that's not within the bill. But I think there are concerns about the direct impact that will have on, on the homelessness sector True. and other bits of legislation which is coming forward on that. So can I just ask what was going to be put in place to ensure effective joint working between homelessness services and the potential national care service? So, uh, Commissioner, Mr Briggs and others around the table know um, the role that I had previously um, and the changes that we made in terms of um, homelessness legislation regulation and changes um, in terms of culture um, and I certainly want to ensure that all of that hard work that has been done uh, continues to bear fruit um, and that means uh, that there has to be uh, an interconnection of services um, without doubt uh, I recognise we all recognise, I think, uh, how value, uh, valuable um, the uh, interfaces between housing and homelessness services uh, with the National Care Service will be. Um, and again, we're working closely with stakeholders um, through the development of National Care Service to make sure that all of those links are in place. Um, we've already um, held uh, uh, our first roundtable meeting with the Homelessness Prevention Strategy Group, which I used to chair myself, um, and will continue to uh, engage regularly and meaningfully with the sector. I've met with people myself, uh, you would expect that to be the case. Um, and again, uh, you know, we, with all services, you know, no matter what is in or out of National Care Service, we have to make sure that those linkages are there. I don't want any difficulties in terms of transition uh, phases or anything like that that we've seen before. What I would say to the committee um, is in terms of my work um, with colleagues across government, um, we are very, very clear um, that uh, you know, we have to get all of these linkages absolutely right. And that's why there's a lot of work going on in the background. Um, and Again, some may argue that um, maybe that's diverting uh, resource to deal with NCS rather than in the here and now. But a huge amount of that work that's going on in the background is work that we need to do anyway in mm -hmm. order to improve linkages, to stop difficult transitions. So I, I would say uh, to the committee, uh, you know, I, I'm very well aware uh, where you know, there could be blips. Um, and we're doing everything possible to make sure that those connections are there. Okay, thank, thank you for that. And I think for the, the committees who are all looking at this, there is real concern out there from different sectors about what that will look like, what detail they haven't been part of. So, you know, as this progresses through Parliament, I think it's critical that we start to get answers on that as well. I, I think, you know, people are always wary of change. Um, and sometimes uh, we tend to look at the possible ne negatives, the challenges, rather than looking at the opportunities. 
uh, and I think there are a huge amount of opportunities uh, here. Now, I'm, as I say, um, very happy uh, to continue to engage and to listen uh, with the housing and homelessness sector and other sectors as well. I want them to be involved in the co-design so that we get this absolutely right. Homelessness services may not be an NCS, but very much we need those voices uh, in order to get those connections right. Yeah, no, I agree on, on that point. And just finally, uh, convener. Um, just ask, uh, is your next question around homelessness? Um, no, it was going on to the second one. OK, it's just we've moved on to theme sure. nine, so we've moved a bit far ahead. As long are, are you are you're still no, on theme? That's OK for homelessness. OK, thank you. Um, OK, we'll, we'll move on to questions from Foisal Chowdhury to be followed by Paul McLean, and thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, I think my question was on third sector. Uh, uh, how will the third sector be integrated into the long-term delivery of the national care service? Uh, I know the Minister has uh, given a lot of examples, but uh, uh, I'm not clear how that will be integrated into the long-term delivery of the national care service. Um, the third sector is uh, a valued part of social care here in Scotland, um, and it will continue to be uh, as we move forward. Uh, the third sector at this moment are delivering uh, quality social care across Scotland, sometimes very specialised uh, social care um, as well. Um, and, uh, you know, third sector organisations uh, are absolutely vital in terms of providing uh, advocacy uh, for people um, and a huge range of other services. Um, so, I, I have no doubt uh, that the third sector itself will continue to be a major player in delivery of social care in Scotland uh, on those uh, specialist services uh, as well. Um, and we expect uh, with the National Care Service that there will be a mixture of providers. Um, and uh, that is uh, the way it should be. What I would say um, is that uh, in terms of the current scenario that many third sector um, organisations face in terms of procurement and tendering, that does not work well for, for many organisations at this moment. Um, and I think, again, you have heard from people this morning and uh, before, you have probably heard that you know, in some areas it is much easier for a third sector organisation to operate than it is in others because of the procurement tendering situations that exist. Uh, and we have the ability with ethical procurement um, to iron out uh, some of the difficulties that have arisen uh, over um, the past two, three decades um, in order to get that right. And again, that will give um, a much greater clarity uh, to third sector organisations than uh, many would say that they have at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Faisal. Move now to Paul McLennan. Faisal, I'll ask the first question, and uh, the Minister touched on the second question I was going to ask about procurement, so thanks for that. W one small question was in terms of that was around about representation on care boards uh, for the third sector. I just wondered what your views were on that, and that's the only sure. question I have on that. So sure, you're being uh, very naughty, Mr McLennan, because uh, I said that I really don't want to be drawn and giving my views that's only fine. around about who should be um, around, those ta around the table. However, I think that in terms of the discussion uh, in the co-design phase, um, I think that many folk will say and advocate that the third sector um, should be there. But, you know, uh, it's a matter for the co-design. Yeah. Thanks, Amina. That's me. Thank you very much. We'll now move now to our last theme, homelessness, and I will take questions first from Deputy Convener Emma Rod. Thank you, Convener. Um, we did hear concerns from Crisis earlier on and in their written submissions uh, around homelessness not being one of the functions of the NCS. Does the Minister believe that the public sector 
prevention duties and other joint working will ensure that adequate consideration is given to preventing and supporting those who are experiencing homelessness? Um, yes, uh, in short, uh, you know, we are bringing forward those new duties to prevent homelessness, uh, including the new duties on public bodies uh, to ask and to act to prevent homelessness. That has to be embedded um, in NCS. Um, and you know, we need to ensure that there are much earlier interventions um, than there often are at this moment. We need to ensure um, that there is case coordination in order to get it right for folks. Um, and we need to do this across services, not just National Care Service but across services as a whole. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that Ms Roderick and the committee are aware that um, the new duties will be uh, guided by that uh, shared principles, that uh, shared principles of public responsibility to prevent homelessness. Um, you know, this is some of the work that um, has happened over the past number of years, which I was involved in previously. Um, you know, just because I've changed jobs doesn't mean to say that I don't have a deep interest in ensuring that um, we get this right. Uh, you know, the lessons that we have learned from the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group um, and the lived experience panels that we put in place uh, around about that work too uh, gives uh, us as a government, gives Ms Robeson um, uh, the, 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 the right uh, information in terms of to ensure that um, this work leads to, um, to real change across the board. That's, that's really reassuring. And, and speaking of early intervention, are there, are there discussions ongoing at this early stage around the NCS in particular and how it's going to react to and, and be compatible with the, the prevention duties? We will look at all of this as we move forward. You know, I, I've had a, a, a fair amount of uh, discussion with Ms Robeson. Um, uh, officials um, are working together in all aspects um, of this. And, you know, there, I, I know that your um, emphasis is on homelessness prevention here, but also we have to look at um, where um, there is already that, um, uh, that intersection between care um, and housing. So if you look at housing first, for example, um, you know, which I'm very proud um, the way that we've moved forward in Scotland. I don't have the most up-to-date figures, so uh, excuse me, but uh, if, uh, if I get this slightly wrong, but figures from a while back showed that, you know, tenancy retention rates for folks in Housing First was 90%. Now, most folk never thought that would be achievable. Why has that happened? It's not just the housing aspect. It's ensuring that um, care services match, that um, uh, addiction services match, uh, mental health services match. So again, in order to prevent homelessness and to make sure that we're doing our level best for people, um, you know, there has to be that continued cooperation uh, uh, across the piece to ensure that we're doing the right thing by the person. Thank you. And, and my, my final uh, question today, convener, is around uh, what we heard from the last panel. Um, Larch Highland uh, told us that there were concerns that rural voices wouldn't be heard unless the co-design was, was taking place in those communities um, and was funded enough to, to provide things like travel expenses for, for voices from those communities to be able to, to feed in. Um, is this something the Minister is happy to look into or perhaps already is? Uh, this is an all Scotland uh, programme uh, and we have to get it right for everyone, uh, whether they live uh, in a city like this one um, or an island um, or uh, rural areas. Uh, and in all of that, we also have to draw the distinction uh, between those folks who live in very remote rural areas. I want everybody involved in this uh, and we will do what we can uh, to ensure that we get as many voices as possible. Um, and I should say to the committee in terms of my uh, travels, and I'm really pleased that you know, we can get out and about a bit more now. You know, I recently um, visited uh, Shetland 
and it may well be in terms of uh, looking at aspects of uh, the uh, care boards, for example, or um, you know, delivery that we may have to adapt for island communities or um, some of the more ro remote communities. And we're open to that, and we need those voices to say to us, well, you know, that may not be quite good enough for us here because. So we'll do all we can to uh, attract these voices. Uh, and I have to say that, um, you know, there are other, uh, if we move away from geographical communities, uh, we also have to ensure uh, that we hear the voices um, of other communities too, including minority communities that often, you know, are much more difficult to get to come to the table. Uh, and again, you know, in recent weeks, uh, thankful to MECOP here in Edinburgh, who gave me the opportunity um, to talk to um, Chinese and South Asian carers um, and their loved ones, um, and folks from the Gypsy Traveller community too. So we, we're doing our best in terms of trying to get all of the voices that we can. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And I must apologise, Minister, I did skip over our last theme, so we do have one final theme left, which is carers. And I just have questions from one member, Miles Briggs. Thank you. Thank you, Kavina. Um, most important last, I think, is probably what I would, would say, because for unpaid carers, I think we need to see how this bill is also going to deliver for them. Now, um, looking at the Carer Scotland Act 2016, another Aberdonian, Nanette Milne, who I know the Minister knows well, brought forward amendments to put in place uh, breaks for carers. I think that was really important at the time, but it hasn't been delivered, and that's partly due to the fact that support plans um, are not being delivered or not being commissioned. Um, statistics show around £20,000 of an estimated, uh, sorry, 20,000 people of an estimated 339,000 unpaid carers are only able to access these. So I just wondered how the, the potential bill is going to make sure that's turned around and that people who, who are unpaid carers actually get these breaks. So, as far as I'm concerned, improved carer support is one of the core objectives of the National Care Service. And uh, I have to say um, that I was at Carers Parliament last week um, and uh, heard stories which are galling, uh, to say the least. Um, the government has uh, put substantial resource into carers support um, and, you know, over the last period, uh, recognising uh, what folks have gone through uh, with COVID, we put additional monies in uh, to allow for more short-term breaks. Um, but if you talk to folk at Carers Parliament, um, and you'll hear it in your constituencies as well, that money often does not get to the people uh, that it should. Um, and you know we have to do much better in that regard, and that is why um, you know we have in this bill um, enshrined that right to short-term breaks. Now, obviously, we have got work to do in that as well, and again, we need to listen. Um, but it is absolutely essential uh, that we get this element uh, of it absolutely right. Uh, I. I think it was a, a man from Shetland again, and uh, um, I, I'll, I'll name him because I think I've seen his name in the paper, so hopefully when I get into trouble, a guy called Jim Guyon from Shetland, who was saying, you know, he has asked um, Shetland Health and Social Care Partnership and others where money for carer support is going there, and says he is unable to get that information. Um, you know, folks shouldn't have a... A, a difficulty in getting that information around about where money is going. Um, and again, you know, there, was, there were discussions at the Carers Parliament by some around about whether government should actually ring fence elements uh, of carers support. Uh, that's not popular with local government, as we all know. It's often not popular uh, with some of you folks around the table. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's a level of frustration uh, out there amongst many carers um, that, you know, they are not getting the deal um, that they should be. Uh, and this will enhance those rights. Th thank you for that. And I think as the bill progresses, it's something I want to 
try to make sure any amendments can, can actually deliver. Uh, just finally, Kavina, the Minister started this session and the Cabinet Secretary said when he launched the bill that we're going to end the postcode lottery of care in Scotland. And that's something we all want to see. But I just wondered, given this framework bill um, has been designed around the NHS, we have a postcode lottery within our NHS, but Ministers are responsible for policy direction and responsible for delivery as well. Why will this be different? Because I worry as an Edinburgh MSP who has some of the worst delayed discharge in the country, some of the highest homelessness in the country, that that necessarily isn't going to change with this bill. So I just wondered what learning the Minister thinks Ministers who have been responsible for the NHS for 16 years are bringing to this bill. So I think the, the key element of uh, all of this is getting the national high quality standards right to end those postcode lotteries. Um, and if you look at it from the other um, side of my portfolio in terms of mental well-being, you know, um, I'm doing similar in terms of introduction of standards um, for uh, various uh, treatments. So we now have um, a new uh, CAMS standard specification. So that should make change right across Scotland um, in terms of the way uh, services are delivered, improving uh, those services. Uh, because you've heard me say before, you've heard others say before, you know, CAMS and Grampian, because of the way that they change delivery, much more community focus, um, have gone through the pandemic period um, in fairly good shape, still delivering for people, um, much lower waiting times, uh, reaching the targets in the main. We need those same standards everywhere. So that's what we have done in CAMS. We're about to do the same in terms of psychological therapies, and I intend to do that across the board. So those quality standards, specifications are important in terms of ending those postcode lotteries. Beyond that, though, um, what we also need to do, um, and I think uh, because all of this is going to be at the forefront of our mind, um, is to also change some of the cultures um, that have built up in certain places, which actually impede good service delivery, good care and support delivery for folk. Um, and again, I come back to my point around about not just the high quality standards, but also making sure that good practice is exported across the board, because uh, it often is not. Um, and uh, I think uh, you know, the flexibility that will be in the system will still uh, at a local level will still lead to different ways of working and we should learn from those different ways of working and make sure that the, those base ways you know, become the norm. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Convena. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you, Minister, and thank you to all the witnesses who joined us this morning. Um, it's been a very, help, very helpful session. So that concludes our public business for today. Next week, we will be taking evidence from VoiceAbility on their progress to date in providing independent advocacy under the Social Security Scotland Act 2018. We will also consider an instrument relating to the Scottish Child Payment Regulations. We will now move into private. Can members who are joining us remotely please use the Microsoft Teams link in their calendars to join the meeting and I close this meeting. <laughs>